Hello, everyone. Thank you for waiting so patiently. Um, you guys are the neediest chatters in the world, but thank you so much. I appreciate it. Okay, I'm very excited for today's subject matter. We are discussing whether or not humans are inherently good or evil. And this is going to be hopefully a really good discussion, not a debate. We are not here to change minds. We are here to trade ideas. Uh, <laughs> this is child abuse. My, everyone feels like they're being abused now with our presence. I'm very excited to dive into it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read something from Tao Te Ching that I think goes along with this. It's titled Goodness. And then I'll share a little bit of my thoughts and then I'm going to throw it to my wonderful guests here so you guys can all learn who they are today. So according to Tao Te Ching, goodness, true goodness is like water. It nurtures everything and harms nothing. Like water, it ever seeks the lowest place, the place that all others avoid. This is the way of the Tao. For a dwelling, it chooses the quiet meadow. For a heart, the circling eddy. In generosity, it is kind. In speech, it is sincere. In power, it is order. In action, it is gentle. In movement, it is rhythm. Because it is always peaceable, it soothes and refreshes. And I thought that was like a really lovely way to start off the discussion. Uh, with that said, what the reason I wanted to talk about this and the reason I invited the people that I did is because one, I've spoken to all of them in the past, and I think they're all really good people. And I thought to myself, like, who better to have on than good people? I don't even know who the evil person would be if I wanted to reach out to them anyways, right? So when we talk about if humans are inherently good or evil, of course, my stance is pretty known on the internet. I think humans are generally good and inherently good because we are within our own nature and our nature is good. With that said, good is subjective. But on the macro, since I think we're all like little energies evolved over time, we are just within our nature, which is good. A bear is good. A bear can act out and cause violence, but a bear is acting within the will of a bear. And so a part of me can't think of it as bad or evil, but I can definitely still retaliate towards something that is also good in its own way. And so that's how I think of goodness. I think sometimes in life we are good battling against good, which is a little bit difficult, I think, in a world that wants a good guy and a bad guy. So those are my initial thoughts. We'll dive into discussion, but why don't we start off with Madame Genevieve? Can you introduce yourself and give us your initial thoughts? Hey guys. Yes, of course. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for hosting us, Brittany. I am Madam Genevieve. Y'all are welcome to refer to me as Jen. I know that's a lot easier for the course of the discussion. Um, I do generally align with Brittany's viewpoint. I think humans are, as an as a general blanket term, I think that our nature is to be good, which to me comes back to the idea of wanting to help each other, build a community, uh, protect our loved ones, things like that. Obviously, there are going to be outliers, um, but I tend to tend to lean towards humanity in general, having an inclination towards goodness. Okay, thank you. And uh, did you tell people who you were, where you they can find you on YouTube? I totally did not. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, um, the coffee faster, babe. <laughs> yeah, sorry. The coffee has not kicked in yet. Um, the best place to find me is on Twitter. It's Madam underscore Genevieve. Um, and that's going to have all my other links there for you guys. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Harmony, can you give us an introduction to who you are and uh, your thoughts? Yeah, I'm Harmony Bancroft. You can find me on Twitter at Harmony Bancroft, also known uh, in some little small corners of the internet as Maiden and Monster. Um, and I guess my take is that humans are inherently neutral. Mm. Um, I believe that inherently we're adaptive. Um, as animals evolved over time, as Whitney says, we're animals, mammals, primates, and persons. And those are each different levels of adaptations that we have. Um, and they come with different needs and different uh, modes of being. And once you get to the person level, that's where you have the concepts of good and evil. So it's not inherent. I don't think it comes after our inherent adaptation. And I think we tend to call things that are adaptive good, and we tend to call things that are maladaptive evil. Mm. And so I think essentially evil is just a parasitic process on what we call the good. 
Um, and so if I zoom into that person level, I do believe that we are essentially good because I believe it's good that we're adaptive. But again, essentially we're adaptive. Mm, love it. Okay. Oh my gosh. Arena, let's go. Introduction, who you oh are my and your gosh. initial thoughts. <laughs> Hi, I'm Arena. Um, on YouTube, I'm Arena Nana and uh, Harmony just took the words out of my brain. Um, I come from a biology background. So I think if we zoom out, I think organisms, humans are inherently neutral. Um, and I think that when we act within the interest of our species, that is what Harmony said we call good. Um, and to expand it to other animals when animals are acting against the interest of their species, as, but particularly if they're a social species. So bats will shun greedy bats who don't share food. Crows will shun greedy, greedy crows. Um, and to use an example of my cat, he is a terrible hunter. He cannot he he will not kill anything uh which is what cats are designed to do uh by my human standard he is my favorite cat he is a good cat by other cat standards maybe he's not such a good cat oh my goodness and there's a cat on the screen anyway that's about sums up my thoughts <laughs> beautiful i love it well to our uh gentleman here sleeve with the cat what are you who are you where can they find you and what are your thoughts Sure. Um, thank you for having me, Brittany. Really happy to be here. My name is Sleeve T. Rocks, rocker boy with violence on my mind. Uh, I am not evil. I'm just mischievous. Um, so I wanted to take a little bit of a different approach. I don't think that humans are necessarily good or evil. I think that humans are inherently hungry. Now, when I think of philosophy, uh, generally my favorite philosophers have been Nietzsche, uh, Thomas Aquinas, T um, Hobbes, uh, John Locke, that kind of thing. And I think that a common thread that I see through most of these is the idea that all humans are inherently hungry. We all have to eat at the most base level. When we want to eat, we're at least going to sacrifice a carrot. So, so your hunger comes at a cost no matter what. Evil seems to be how much you're willing to let that hunger encroach on other people. So, for example, if you know that it's an unnecessary uh, satiation that you're uh, partaking in, but you want it and you're willing to hurt other people to get it, I think that's when you're stepping into evil territory. Now, if you're inherently a good or evil person, it's a little bit more uh, less consequential to me personally, because I think that when you are genuinely good or genuinely evil, it doesn't really matter as long as your actions are good. Uh, your mindset is kind of secondary to that. Uh, there are a lot of things I'd like to uh, explore with this. Number one has always been Calvin and Hobbes for me personally. Every year Calvin like has to figure out how to get the most amount of presents for Christmas and so he has to go through deep philosophical quandaries about what it truly means to be a good boy. Uh, is he just doing it to get presents? Is he doing it in order to uh, you know genuinely be a good person or is he just performatively trying to get as much loot as possible? Those are some of the examples I want to explore today and uh, like I said happy to be here. I'm happy to meet y'all. Uh, and if you guys want to check anything out that I do, I usually play horror video games and talk about music at twitch.tv slash sleeptrocks. Check me out. Perfect. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited already. This is getting good. Okay. Go ahead and Smith, please introduce yourself and your initial thoughts. I'm Smith. I'm a real Smith on YouTube. I'm a streamer and content creator. Um, to continue the trend of the males having the, the negative view of humanity, well, <laughs> sleeve, you know, more so than the others, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say that I think that we're born... I wouldn't say evil because I think it's a loaded word, but I'll use the word if we're using it. But I think that we're born bad. And the the, way, the reason I, I say that is because if I, I think that it, what a human is fundamentally should be looked at from how we are born. And I think we can be raised to be good people. But I, I think that without uh, being raised properly, we'll, we will become bad people. Um, somebody with a personality disorder, for example, is someone who had a like bad childhood, and now that uh, impacts how they interact with other people in a negative way. Um, what we define as negative is a byproduct of what we see as functional within society. Um, and we teach our kids to live and function within a society in a healthy way. So things that we consider personality disorders are people failing to raise their kids, basically, in a way that um like that we like you know that, that you your your personality disorder it's because we don't we don't like how you are in society it hurts people we say we, we we believe it hurts people um but even though i think that we are born evil and that 
uh, we might have that tendency. I still love all people, and I think that that's the only way that we can be good. Mm. Love it. Good? That's great. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, and Tom, who are you, and what are your initial thoughts? Uh, yeah, my name's Tom. Go by Tom Foolery on YouTube mostly. Um, I don't like words like evil generally. It sounds a little religious to me, but yeah, I'm going to take it as like, uh, when I think of something evil, I think of something like really bad, super heinous, probably somebody without empathy or doing something malicious, um, especially like if you want to hurt somebody or don't care if you hurt somebody, you don't care about the outcomes in these cases. Uh, with that in mind, I would say that then humans are inherently evil. Uh, the I think that we will naturally kill, will naturally steal from anyone when it benefits us. Uh, we have to build social constructs like evil, like bad, to label people so that we can stigmatize those people and allow other people to see the warning signs, see the red flags and say, hey, this person's doing something negative. And because we stigmatize these things and we are social animals, we care about those red flags. We care if people don't wanna associate with us anymore. And so we tend to not do those things just to avoid the stigmatization. Okay, that's really interesting already. So I'm going to primarily throw it to you guys and then I'll interject because I will monologue and I don't want to do that to anybody here. So who has some initial thoughts? I and immediately when Smith said we are born evil, I thought of original sin, uh, which I, I agree with Tom. It seems a little interestingly religious. Now, I think... I think the whole reason we even have this concept is because we are inherently social animals. If we put a baby and imagine this baby doesn't need social interaction, doesn't need like to be around other humans, I think it'll just grow up to be an ape, a primate. It will find food, perhaps, yes, kill animals. I don't think killing is inherently bad because it is what we are naturally inclined to do for nourishment. Um, it will steal resources from other organisms who would like to use those resources for its own survival. Uh, but I think that's kind of the function of a living organism. If I could chime into what Smith said really quick, um, Smith made a delineation between having a bad childhood, but he says that if you uh, have like no input from parents or, uh, you know, at least limited input, that that would be uh, leading towards bad actions. So I just want to differentiate. Is, are you talking about bad childhood versus neutral childhood? Because if we're talking about someone who had more of a neutral childhood, I would imagine that they would end up more morally neutral. And if they did have a bad childhood, like they had an abusive father, for example, they probably would um, be more inclined towards evil. So I just want to figure out what you meant by that. You're muted. Okay, okay. A, a term that I've heard in psychodynamic like communities is a, a good enough parent. Um, so to, in, rather than saying a good parent and a bad parent, a good enough parent. Because really, th there's a line there where it's like, okay, now you fucked up. And at and, and some point, you could figure it out. And, but it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of ambiguity as to how much... Like, most of us don't have the worst parent in the world, you know, even if we had bad parents. But... If it's enough to fuck you up so that we would diagnose you, then I would say that's kind of like not like not ideal. But when you're talking about limited input from your parents, as in, you know, like you're not being shaped by some larger figure, whether that be society or your parents, uh, that will lead you towards naturally our natural evil uh, nature. So what I'm trying to figure out is, do you think that if your parents just weren't there, you would naturally end up evil? Or if your parents, you know, had like any input whatsoever, that would steer you in one direction or another? Well, I think with your complete parents completely not there whatsoever, like a totally feral child, like Genie, um, you'll be completely mentally handicapped. You have to have like your parents to like code in like your brain, like so that your your brain is the hardware, and you have to have your parents like like program your brain almost by socializing with you. But I think that back in the day, we stopped being children way sooner, like eleven or twelve, 
And now we have a much longer incubation period. And that's because we have a lot higher standards within society. So we have to learn more lessons from our parents. So if we stopped parenting our kids at 12 now, they wouldn't turn out to be people that function within society. They'd probably be you know, messed up. I have a question for you, Smith. Um, do you believe that a being that is feral, whether it's a human or a cat, or whatever kind of being we're talking about, that feral, wild behavior. Am I following correctly to believe that you see that as bad or evil? Because in my opinion, that kind of base level of existence is, if anything, neutral. Um, I mean, sure, maybe it's killing things to eat or you know as ari mentioned stealing something from some other being that may want those resources but that feels like from a survival standpoint more neutral i think like by i think that evil is a loaded word but uh i think that if if you don't be if you aren't able to mature past the age of two years old um like that that is like um you can be you can be a fully functional adult but still have the mentality of a two-year-old where like you, you you're like it like everyone is mommy and daddy and it's like and it's like you're you're like you're, you're you're harming everybody um i think that if you are a feral child you are only fixated on things that aren't you have no connection to other people in society and i think being plugged in to the enmeshment of society and like what we consider good and bad behavior and stuff. If you're not plugged into that, um, I think that that can only come out as bad. Um, but a feral child, it, we, we won't see them as bad because we just have so much like pity almost because it's like, it's like, we're not even looking at like, like Jeannie, the person I'm talking about, they, they only ever developed a vocabulary of like uh, 200 words. Like, like, ba like we're not even looking at them like a human. We're looking at them like a, like, like a strange creature. Like, like we feel so bad, you know, but it's like, we failed to make you a new human. I have a question. I mean, oh, sorry. Oh, no, um, no, you have, it sounds like you have a great question. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, it's kind of similar vein of what Sleeve was talking about. But if you believe that we are inherently evil, then why would society be pushing us? Because society is made up of humans, right? So why would then society be pushing us to be good or what we as humans are defining as good if we were inherently evil? Why would he, we have the standard of goodness? It's because I think it's a chicken or the egg thing. So I think we have society, we have laws and stuff because people might tend towards like bad things. And that's why we need to encourage people to 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 enmesh with our rules. Um, and I think that without it, we wouldn't. I think we need society to be good. We only can define goodness as a byproduct of society. But without, without society, how can you necessarily be evil if you don't have anybody to integrate with or anybody to harm? Uh, you know, your appetites and your aversions aren't bumping against the will or desires of anybody else. Um, right. You know, I don't know how good or evil can even like necessarily work in a feral setting because you're kind of in a setting where you are not affecting other humans. And so therefore your morality in relation to other humans. And that's another good question is, does your morality simply extend to your fellow man or does that extend to your obligations to your environment, maybe fellow species that you are surrounded with? You know, like how far does this go? Is evil simply what you do to your fellow man is basically my point, I guess. It depends how you define it because, uh, I, I, like the, one of the last things I put in my notes is if you define good as humanity, which is totally reasonable, which I think a lot of people kind of are doing, uh, that then then we we are good, and I and I and I, I kind of get that, but and I, and I like that a lot, but I I I can't live in that because, um, I I want to have a standard like uh, I I just I I if I, if I want to be able to. I think being like judgmental isn't like a bad thing. I think we can critique each other and uh, like in, in in a way that we that that is helpful. And um, like I said, even if someone's like bad or evil, it doesn't mean I'm stop I stop loving them. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess the reason. Oh, go ahead, Tom. You haven't talked yet. 
you earlier you were saying that you do think that we're inherently evil or inherently bad but then when you were talking about the feral child who would be this like natural uh thing you said that we wouldn't call them evil or bad it sounds well, like you're you feel like the knowledge of what you're doing has if to we, be there in order for us to call you evil or bad and so therefore you wouldn't actually call them evil or bad is that right yeah because well the, the, i think that we just don't see them as a human in the same way they, we see other humans like someone with like a like a like a hand like a mental disability like like um, what if we see like someone with like severe autism like having like a like a lashing out in public or something like we we like that we don't think that that's good but also we have like a different like we have a different standard that we hold them to like because we know what they're capable of you know and, and uh if, if someone is not capable of meeting the standard so that so then what what would it mean for us to be naturally evil then if you're looking at the most natural thing possible one that has no socialization we have not put morals into them yet you're still saying that they're not bad or evil well, and what does it mean for us to be naturally bad or well, evil there's two different things being a feral child is having no like socialization so that you like functionally can't like think at all um but but I'm just like, I, but I think that if you're just raised poorly, you're abused as a child, you're more likely to be abusive. And that, and I think that the lack of parenting, um, like, so a, a childhood in, uh, in the 1400s would probably be extremely abusive by today's standards. And I'm sure that the people in the 1400s, we would see as much more immoral and much more evil by today's standards. And we only grow, we only get better because we add more rules onto what we want people to be and more expectations. Um, I don't know if I entirely agree with that. I think that sometimes rules are a desire for humans to be predictable in a way. When we add more rules to society, we have less that is going to go outside the bounds of what we can expect on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's kind of amoral. Um, but the other thing that I think is that do people truly like have to know that they're evil in order to be evil? Um, for example, I would imagine that most people who like went to prison, mobsters, things like that, are probably going to have pretty good justifications for why they did what they did. No, I was backed into a corner. My wife and family had to eat. I had to do this, blah, blah, blah. I, as a matter of fact, I read this book. It's called uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And it talked a lot about how a lot of criminals who they uh, interacted with seemed to think that their actions were fully justified. They were backed into a corner. And so that kind of goes along with my uh, principle of appetite versus aversion, where your appetite is going to convince you that some of your actions are more righteous than they are. And I would imagine most people, even if they're doing things that are going to harm a lot of people, are still going to justify it as it was necessary in order to fulfill this appetite that we all have. Um, so that's one of the things that I would have to say about just like our natural inclination to good or even our understanding of if we're good or not. Well, it depends. There's two different things that could be happening. It could be that they are defining good as something that you're not defining it as, or it could be because they don't understand the harm or don't care about the harm. That's three things. They don't understand the harm, they don't care about the harm, or they're defining good as something that's alternative to the harm that they are saying is more important. When I was a little kid, I, I was taking ballet classes, and in the waiting room, there was a, this black mother, and I was like five, okay? And she had like kind of green skin, okay? And so I, I, I went up to her and I was like, I don't like your skin. I don't like your skin color. I think it's ugly. And and uh, my parents were like, what the, f you know? They, and I got like spanked and I got in like big trouble for that. And I didn't understand what's happening. My parents then explained to me that, you know, like that's like, that's bad. You shouldn't like be disc discriminated and stuff. And I was like, oh, I get it. And then I went back the next day and I was like, oh, it's not because you're black. It's because of your skin color. You just have a very strange skin tone. It's not because you're black. I just think you, something wrong. And I just didn't understand. And I, and I had to be taught that in order to not be hurting people in that way. Yeah, I do think we that, need that to That doesn't sound people. evil to me. Mm. Yeah, okay. that doesn't sound like evil to me. That sounds like it's a... Uh... I mean, that sounds more like a social faux pas that you accidentally stepped on the toes of. You know, if you were like gonna, if was there genuine harm that was brought from that? Probably not, but I imagine that there was a little bit of social stigma that was, you know, aroused because of that. And so your parents just had to be like, hey, in polite society, that might make people feel a little weird, but you're not, did your parents tell you you were evil for doing that? No, but I, I, I think about this often and maybe I'm, I'm probably 
thinking that I had more of an effect than I did, but I can't imagine if I heard some kid, little kid say that, like, no, it, you're uniquely disgusting to me. Like, you know, like that would be like, wow, that's like, that would be truly that would stick to me. I wouldn't but want to be told that they might have perceived that as evil. They might have said, like, you're just coming up and calling me green because you think green people are bad. So that might have seemed like an evil action. And that's another thing I think is kind of interesting that maybe we should explore is the personal perception of badness versus like genuine badness and how you can differentiate your own personal response to something that might disgust you or make, make you feel like that person's a bad person for doing that versus genuine evil that actually causes harm. Uh, cause to me, that doesn't sound like it's genuine harm to me. That sounds, and like I said, I wasn't in their shoes. What do I know? But you know, to me, that sounds like it's just a social faux pas. Was that genuine evil? Doesn't sound like it. Or was um, it intentional else, is the question I want to know. It was, was not that, intentional. You, yeah. You were just yeah, saying the intention was, uh, is important in my mm -hmm. definition of good versus evil. Same. Same. Yeah, yeah same. same. I was talking about having, being malicious or just not caring at all for the outcomes, not having any empathy for the person. It doesn't sound like that. So what? What are? You, how are you differentiating something? Uh, I or what I would you call evil? Yeah, I, I for me, it's not the intention. I think intentions don't matter. Only the the actual effect it has on other people. Mm. So that's the are difference you, here. Are you familiar with materialism uh, as far as uh, philosophy is concerned? Um, not probably not as well as you, but uh, just curious. Um, somehow there, you're talking, the, but yeah, it, it's the idea of basically that morality is a science and that there is a base level understanding that you can like scientifically deduce just based on the material reality of our world. Um, so that means that good versus evil is just like a positive or negative that you're inputting into the world. It doesn't matter about your mindset. It is just materially good or bad. So that's one thing that I think should be explored. It doesn't sound like it was materially bad what you did, but I think it you was. Know, that... I think oh, it was, okay, like, interesting. I, but it, but it, I think materialism, like uh, I would, from what you just said, have a caveat. It depends on how you define the the good and bad, because I I believe that that behavior is a harmful effect on the people around you. If I was like that all the time, you know that that wouldn't be like that would make everyone's day worse. It would, and mm -hmm. I'm sure eventually it would like really be worse. It would be it would yeah. be worse than that. So. That's a good point. I, I think that it, the action could have had evil impact regardless of your intention. So you, while that doesn't make you a bad person, maybe that was an objectively bad action due to the impact that it had. Yeah. Mm. Okay, I, I think I'm following this. Um, I'm going to shut up for a little bit. Anybody else? I just want to say that everything everyone has said so far just kind of backs up my belief that we're adaptive. And uh, that good is adaptive and evil is maladaptive. Um, I was going to say, when we talk about inherent, or I, I'm going to go back real quick to the 1400s that Smith mentioned, I, I think the fact that as we are growing through the, the generations, we are doing better. We're learning about child development. Gentle parenting is more in the know now i think that does prove at the very least like what harmony's saying the adaptive behavior um the expansion of our arena and there's this quote by carl rogers and it's it's kind of biological but it's from a business book called client-centered therapy uh, and it's from i believe 1951 and it says the organism so this is just any living thing has one basic tendency and striving to actualize, maintain, and enhance the experiencing organism. And that's, I feel like, what we are doing with each generation on the whole, right? Like, the fact that I can go outside, go to the grocery store, and not get stabbed to death a bunch of times, and every day I can pretty reliably do that, nice. I think proves to me that we're moving in the direction that we as humans have decided is good right because i don't think there is such a thing as good floating around in the universe there is only what we as organisms yeah. decide we, is good for our species did we decide that we wanted to become more good or are there better enforcement mechanisms for that goodness for example, some would argue that the expansion of the police state would uh, keep people from inherently acting out the animalistic urges that they might have to hurt people or do bad, I guess. Um, while other people might even see that exact police apparatus as bad unto itself because it limits free will. 
Um, so sometimes I wonder, are we actually getting better or are we just getting better at stamping out d actions that we have deemed undesirable through an enforcement mechanism, which really does, uh, stifles our free will? But I will say that we are like apes, humans, we are social animals, right? Like this, this is a issue like of like policing, I guess, in other social animal societies as well, right? Like punishing a social <laughs> behavior or behavior that that group of animals has decided is a social or amoral. So I think because we are inherently social animals, then we inherently will want to um, be in as harmonious of groups as possible and mutually beneficial groups as possible. And we have Your to keep mic is a little high. I don't know if you're able to adjust your volume, um, but it's I think it's peaking on my end a little bit. Yeah. I I think that we continuously are adding to and redefining what we define as something that can be harm and uh that that's constantly growing. Continually adapting. I, I, I guess mm -hmm. what I'm thinking of, have, have you guys seen the movie Clockwork Orange or, you know, you've heard of the book, yeah. I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. uh, Clockwork Orange, like it explores this uh, dilemma where there's a truly bad kid. He's going around harming people constantly, breaking into their houses, stealing their stuff, doing terrible, pe terrible things to the guy's wives. You know, it's a really, really awful tale um, until he gets arrested and they decide, hey, we can make this guy good. And the way we can make him good is just by preventing him from ever being able to commit a bad action. So what we're going to do is we're going to keep his eyeballs open. We're going to force him to watch a bunch of movies. And this is going to give him a violent sickness to any evil thought that he might have. So he goes back out into the world, and now he can't commit any evil. Um, he's like out there, like, you know, he thinks the same things. He wants to do the same things, but he can't. He physically can't. And it actually has some ramifications because he can't actually even defend himself because when people try to encroach on his uh, desires and will, then he can't even punch them in the face to defend himself anymore because that's an evil action. Um, so I thought that that book uh, really helped me understand like the importance of having free will in the battle of good and evil. It's not enough to just tell to prevent someone from doing good or evil. It's about having them have the a framework to be able to exercise those options and to be able to decide for themselves uh, that the good actions are the ones that are desirable. Um, but I want to hear everybody's thoughts on that. Do you think that just simply preventing bad actions is enough to fix society or is there a moral dilemma with that? No, because if you do it in an immoral well, way. Think, yep. Okay, Smith and then Harmony, go ahead. If you, if you do it in an immoral way, then it's then it's still immoral. Like. Uh, I, I, I like, but that's just how I define good. So I, I, in my universe of good, the, the, the enforcement also cannot be like evil. It has to also be good. Harmony. So you I, think that? I think. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. What, Harmony, and then I was Harmony. just gonna say. Um, I think if if, like, I believe that all the actions, all actions have like an adaptive purpose to them, and it can become maladaptive. So, if like, for instance, um, like addiction. You know, even drug use is adaptive when people use, you know, they're doing it for a reason and it has, you know, um, probably a positive, you know, reinforcement in their life. It's adaptive. It can become maladaptive and that's when it's a problem. But I think um, it's it's adaptive. <laughs> so unless you find another way to like fill whatever you're, you know, doing that behavior for, like whatever reason, whatever you know, adaptivity that it is, you know what I mean? Like then, um, yeah, it's not gonna have positive outcomes. You have to find um, maybe healthier ways to adapt. Can I ask you a question, Harmony? When you talk about adaptive versus maladaptive, do you see it as adaptive is basically like neutral and maladaptive is edging towards evil or straight evil? Well, I think that... Uh, one of the ways that we have adaptive in the person realm. So like I said, we're animals, mammals, primates, and persons. And we have different adaptive like, like um, needs and like expressions. So like our social expression is the primate level. Um, like our, our attachment um, expression is the mammal level. Our nervous system uh, expression is the animal level. And, you know... We have different expressions of those and how we are. But then for the person level, that's where we get like um, people are, we're the beings who are concerned with being. 
so that's where we get our existential needs that's where we get our you know concepts of like good and evil and that kind of thing and like social relating at a higher order um towards the good and so we can do things like make civilizations and you know go to the moon and shit like that um so sure. i don't remember what your question was but <laughs> <laughs> well I, I guess i was just kind of getting at you kind of use drug abuse as uh the example mm -hmm. and you said that uh using drugs is you know an adaptive behavior but then eventually mm -hmm. addiction becomes a maladaptive behavior so it sounds so that's when like addiction you're... becomes maladaptive yeah Right. And since the conversation was about good and evil, it sounded like that was like kind of like the jumping off point towards maybe slightly more evil inclinations. So I wanted to clarify. Your yeah, well, I think that's, on the person level, that's like what we might classify as like evil. Like for me also, I do kind of like another question I have maybe for the group is like whether we think that the concepts of good and evil are something that we that are useful for us like if we can evolve past that is that you know a thing or like are they useful for us mm. you know still um i i don't really like them again because it does kind of sound religious um but again i i also know how to use the language i'm not like thick you know what i mean so like in, on on certain levels you know in my day-to-day -day life i you know kind of do act as if i believe in good and evil you know <laughs> so um but yeah it's more like a useful tool than a real thing it kind of sounds like oh i think it's a real thing it's just not yeah. real in the way that like you know solid things are real it's very real though it's just sure. not like yeah physical is real i'm very think... picky about when i say evil yeah i, I say won't... it but very rare what do you what would you classify as like evil it has to be something that I can, I just have decided, like, I'm never okay with it. Just never. Mm. Mm. Never okay with it. Even, what if a person, what if the thing you thought of, whatever it is, is proven somewhere on the planet to have been, quote, of, sort of workable? Not perfect, but workable. Would that change your view of evil? Okay. Actually, it changed my mind. That's not. It has to not. Not. Not that it's never okay. It's just that I really don't like it. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a that's a that, big chasm between those two things. Yeah. yeah well, I think that's it's what never most okay. Of us are thinking of as evil. It's never okay to like me. Just extra bad. Yeah. Yeah. Like it can't be justified in any. It could be reasonable of, capacity. In, I can imagine. For me, I don't know. I don't, is there any? I don't believe in evil, anything like, like that, though. Everything has a chain of causality that makes perfect yeah. sense in an ad adaptive, like you know, mindset to me. So even even the greatest evils that you can think of, I can I can imagine like a, a really contrived scenario where I could imagine like a rape is like it it saved a billion people's lives or something, you know. But like, but that but like that's not normally like what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about that. So can you name one of those examples, Smith? <laughs> And you can yeah, use sense you, of you, language you, if you like. What do you, you, uh, you I don't know. I, I like. I'm not going to come up with a very creative one off the top of my head. Oh, like, I don't man, know. That like, would have been the ultimate example right here. Come the on. only the only way to to stop the the bullet because uh, is um like you, you time travel. Okay, you could do. Tra okay, I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna stop. <laughs> I wish Brittany that you finished Attack on Titan because it would be perfect stop. for this conversation. You know, I, a lot of people haven't yet. I, We're having a discussion on it on the 26 on Discord. But okay, hear me. How is my sound, by the way? I changed my. It seems better. My, still just, a little okay. bit too it's, up. It's better. Just, I lowered yeah, you down. Tom, so. lower her down on your own Discord. Do the right. That's thing. what it's I did. Not, yeah. I, I I did it's as well. No it's the. What? Yeah, it's 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 like once it hits her mic, it's still kind of high, but I, the volume is fine. Okay, okay, it sounds fine to me, but I'm also only have one ear in, so that's how I do things. Okay, I want to say I want to bring us to this possibility of like the reason I wanted to have the conversation was like once we use the word inherently, we're arguing against something that might be out of our control, and then we're arguing something that is in our control, which is our perception, and so it has to force us to actually <laughs> admit out loud that our perception is the decider. And if the, our perception is the decider, is there anything that's even objective? And if there's nothing objective, then what are we ultimately doing? What is the point of even deciphering evil over good? What is the purpose? Yeah, the so I guess... Oh, uh, go ahead. Steve go. and then Smith. The, the objective, okay, so... I, I believe the objective... Uh, <laughs> I believe the objective is what <laughs> people agree on. So like um like if everybody in the room agrees that like it's bad to to kick the dog 
then like it is bad in that room objectively okay. um Sleeve? yeah so that, that was kind of what i was going to get at is the fact that it probably i mean this is seems to be like where the where democracy comes from because um Hobbes, one of my favorite philosophers, one of my favorite philosophers, seems to believe one of my least favorite parts of his philosophy was that if there is a despot or if there is somebody who is an ultimate authority, that's actually good for society because none of us can individually decide what morality is for ourselves. We have to have a higher power that's going to dictate that for us so that we have a framework that we can live within. Uh, if all of us tried to decide it for ourselves, we would not be able to come up with any kind of concrete ob uh, objective morality. So we basically have to have a higher power to uh, appeal to. Sometimes they talk about kings, sometimes they talk about gods. Um, they're basically the guardrails for, hu for humanity's uh, moral compass. So in a lot of ways, I disagree with that because I do think that, and this is just me, I think that we do have an aversion towards genuine evil as a statistical whole for humanity. I think that there are a lot of actions that all like 90 point, not 99.9% .9 of us are probably going to agree is evil. Uh, and, you know, we could talk about things like killing, for example, but some people don't believe that. Some people think we're all going to come to a different understanding and therefore we have to have morality dictated to us from some higher power. Any thoughts? I mean, I think I mean, I, for me, I think it's always going to come down to the objective. I think that it's like about the goal. What is it that we're trying to get to? I think most people want to limit the amount of harm. I think that they want good outcomes. They don't want bad outcomes. Generally, those are going to be based on their feelings. And those can be like, uh, those can change based on culture or based on society. But the, uh, crap, I forgot what. What but those aren't theory. objective values that you were giving is uh, oh, what yeah, things, yeah. and that's, that, that's, that's why right. I was it. talking about the higher powers, because it seems like we don't have a good grasp of universally, like what all of us seem to think is one thing. There are some actions that fall under that, but I don't think that all of us are going to agree on most things in that. I think he meant yeah, goal. I, I don't believe in objective. Yeah, when I said objective, I meant like an objective that you're uh trying to get to some sort of oh goal, excuse like, me excuse trying me, to yeah. reach like outcomes but yeah the um but yeah i don't i don't believe in like an objective morality and i don't think that that's uh i think generally people who are secular are using it to just say like by far the majority of people believe this is bad and so we can just go ahead and assume it's bad but i generally i think that's going to like stifle any sort of conversation I believe in transjective morality, which is um, the relationship between the subject, which is the agent, and the object, and which is like the arena and everything in the environment around it. So you can't just isolate it to the objective. It's always a matter of the relationship that the agent has with the arena, which is why we all have different values and different morals. Mm. Arena, and it's also adaptive, as well? Sorry, adaptive to the arena. Oh, it's just also adaptive to the arena. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So the arena you're saying any uh spectators as well right yep yep it's so you the agent and then the arena which you're also a part of you're not separate from the arena mm -hmm. i had some i wanted to uh add an example of um of uh like adaptiveness because i uh, i think the drug one like it uh I, th I have a better one like maybe screaming like in your childhood in your childhood you have to scream to survive or else, like you would, mm -hmm. you would, you, you would be destroyed. You have to be to feel like a person at all. You have to scream, and then you grow up and you start screaming at everybody. And now it's it was adaptive then. Now it's not. Yeah, yeah. So you're constantly having to change, and that's actually a big problem with people, especially with like your nervous system. That's what like PTSD is, right? So you were in an environment, and so you had a reaction to that environment, and then when you get out of that environment, you don't need that reaction but you still have it it's maladaptive now so you have to adapt yeah is there too uh reductive to say like healthy versus unhealthy versus good and evil is there like a version of healthy that could also be objective could healthy be evil i don't think healthy could be evil but i don't think unhealthy is inherently evil in that Although, oh, oh, here's what I'll say. I think, yeah, I don't think, I think if you're unhealthily, I don't know, smoking cigarettes on the couch by yourself in your room and nobody knows you ever existed, are you really evil? No, you're just, 
neutral and then you die of lung cancer and by yourself in your room right so Wait, i isn't think that I... evil <laughs> no <laughs> isn't it evil to me yourself to the point of getting cancer kind of nobody knows you don't survival. exist <laughs> This is where the Tao comes back in for me because I feel like the perfect balance. You can never have like purely something healthy without at least a bit, you know, of the unhealthy. My that is, that is true. Like, you know, just drinking by yourself isn't evil. But let's say eventually you're drinking by yourself and you obviously have cirrhosis of the liver. You've got an inflated gut and everything. And you know that you're doing objective harm to yourself. I would say that that's an evil action because you are harming yourself. Uh, I don't think the evil simply extends to other people. I think evil extends to yourself, and you can do evil to yourself as well. Mm, I mean, I think it still know. extends to other people, though. Like, I think even w if we talk about suicide, a lot of times the reason that people have issues with suicide is because of how it affects everybody else around you. If you don't want to be here, that's one thing. But everybody else might still want you to be here, even if you are suffering to some extent. And so I agree with that. I agree. That, that's definitely true, but there's also this other element where I think that if you're not living up to any kind of potential that might help you, like, aid in other people, even if they don't even know about your existence, I think that that can be evil unto itself because you are living a completely selfish lifestyle. And if you're living a completely selfish lifestyle, there is potential in humanity that is being untapped. Uh, actually, now that I'm saying that out loud, I don't know if that's necessarily evil, but it feels kind of like it's ebbing into bad territory. Mm, okay, because that's like what is interesting to me the most is we have this like polarity between like good mm. and evil, but where's all like the nuance of the middle of like the condition of the human journey on the micro, obviously. And like, where do we come in with judgment? Where do we come in with prescriptions? Where do we come in with edging society in a better way? Because I almost take the extreme stance that like you have the right to like drink yourself to death or smoke yourself to death or uh, you know in a graceful way unalive yourself you know in a reasonable yeah, we know way. So, <laughs> so i feel like for me when i think about harm i think about harm reduction but i think life in is inherently harmful and i think like bringing a baby into the world is like asking to do harm to that child like by giving birth to a child you have automatically harmed it and at the same time i still think it's ethical because that is like a part of being a person and like we have a species and we procreate and we're biological entities and so a part of me can't fault a human for having a baby all as long as we understand that like existing itself is harmful and so like that's where i get a little like indifferent to how people solely decide to live their life and i think it's wrong of society to guilt them into staying or preserving their nature or to being or changing for the selfish desire of the community because again then the community is causing a harm suffering to the individual that i think harm amplifies so society owes it to the individual to harm reduce by not forcing it to like adapt to them and then the individual needs to learn how not to force society to them as well because again harm reduction sleep Wait, go ahead is it so re really oh, quickly no. sorry mm -hmm. just really quickly do you think that you have any obligation to the community as an individual i think if you understand that you are part of a society yes then you can understand that you have somewhat of an obligation to cause the least amount of harm that you can. And then if you don't like the standard of the society, I do recommend moving to a different society, finding the bubble that matches your level of desire, desirability in any context. Yeah. Uh, like, Tom, like, Tom. Yeah, Tom and Smith. I think from like a more utilitarian perspective, the you as an individual are one person and what it is that you're can doing, what you're doing can affect a greater amount of people. And so, for, for it to be selfish for the like greater society expect something of the individual, even though it will harm the individual, I think that that's like generally a, an expectation that we're going to stick with anyways. That like you're, if you don't abide by the rules, now all of a sudden we're inconsistent or we, um, or we're, yeah, we're allowing things to get a, a little bit too out of control. That one person might have to deal with a little bit of harm so that we don't have greater harm to greater society. I, I think, mm -hmm, okay, sorry. I, no. I, I, I really don't like the, the I, what I see is kind of like the Sigma grind set mentality where we have to, to feel, we, we, our value comes from having to feel like useful to society. Because what I think that that, if that is like how we push everybody, then everyone has to be a CEO. And I think if that was the case, like it would be bad for society. We actually have to have like 
janitors and we have to have like people working at Walmart. And so like I I I think that the the achievement and like the you can be an underachiever and that's actually like good for society. And so you can you you could even be like a uh like a deranged like murderer and by not by locking yourself in your room and not murdering people maybe that's what you can you have to do for society i think you're gonna have to do something that you may not be used to and maybe think of this on more of a spectrum smith uh (laughs) i'm just kidding (laughs) smith puts everything on a spectrum so yeah like things can be good without being the best thing you're expecting us to like make it the best thing every single time which is the ceo whereas like being the janitor is still good it doesn't it doesn't always have to be the best i don't know i kind of think that you do have an obligation to uh your society humanity and our fellow man uh and the reason why is because i think that if you every person decided to check out of society we would not do good i think that's actually our obligation to help our fellow man and to be able to build each other up uh because i do believe we do have a communal uh a communal hardwiring which means that we want to be able to build ourselves up, help ourselves survive. There are natural hierarchies that seem to form just naturally through society without like people saying very much sometimes. Um, And if people decided to not contribute to that at all, and even on like a larger level, that would really like harm our fellow man. So I think that in a lot of ways you do have uh, an obligation to your fellow man uh, checking out would certainly mean catastrophe in my eyes. Well, is being a janitor checking out? Being a janitor is not checking out. That's part of society. Okay. okay, 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 okay. So, so when you say checking out, you mean like, what, what do we exa- What would that look like? Like, I, the thing I'm thinking of is like, you don't have any interaction with your fellow man. Maybe you like stay at home and watch DVDs all the time. Maybe uh, you know, you know that like, there's people out in your community that could use help, but you're not going to do anything about it because you're just you know in your own little space, not doing anything about everybody around you that's kind of how i see it okay the way i tie those two together is i i don't see that as that necessarily evil i know like you're harming society because i think you're also harming yourself so the that, that i don't even have to sure. think of it as a good and bad i just think that that's unhealthy you a- actually going out and helping someone else is actually what's going to be good for you so mm, what I and i would think. say better to lock yourself in the room than make other people deal with you <laughs> Because <laughs> like if you're on an island and no one's dealing or with you, or having then, like, people get to deal with you is how I would see it. True. Now, assuming you're in your room for such a long time, where did you get that room? Who's housing you? Where are you getting food? How are you paying for your life? So you couldn't literally. Yeah, I'm using the room. I'm using the word room colloquially. Let's sure. just imagine a cardboard box on the side of the road where you're sure. there to <laughs> stew on your thoughts, right? Sure, sure. That's sure. ultimately just isolation. I believe is immoral because I do think that we are a communal species that needs to help each other in order to thrive. And to not do that, I think, is, an, is is a selfish action, which seems like it's veering towards a bad action. Mm. But I would say, as a species, generally, yes, we, I, I wouldn't say we have the obligation, but we have the drive, like you said, to live in these communal spaces. But I think if you are born, perhaps, with a defect or a slightly different genome as animals do because DNA mutates and things happen and you are born a social I think as long as you're not benefiting from the communal society then you don't have to contribute to it if you want to go live alone in a forest or if it's not too much of an undue burden for you to benefit from society then I think avoiding social interaction isn't bad well, now i'm hearing bad from the other people in this society because if they're all just I- isolating this one person because of a genetic defect that seems like a little no 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 i mean little... the genetic defect is not wanting to be communal right and so other people would be happy to be in in proximity or in community with them but this person just humans are to... generally social creatures yeah. so if somebody's I'm... like got the genetic inclination to not socialize and to want to isolate so when I you said a genetic dif- I, I was imagining someone with like a like a third hand or something like that <laughs> when you said that <laughs> like people yeah just be better to stay by yourself because i mean nobody's going to understand the third hand you know i hope that's not what people were hearing <laughs> i meant in the social aspect <laughs> yeah, I, mean, like- I can manifest in a lot of ways so i thought i'd just clarify <laughs> I think uh, there's some, something that I've been thinking over and over again that I haven't said is I think that um, what you, you can do what Tom is doing where you can 
um try to frame it in a like a goal oriented like trying to like utilitarian or whatever like you and, and that that is you have you define just define a system and the the objective of that in reaching it is good and going in the opposite direction opposite direction is bad but in general i think that good and evil and right and wrong and good and bad are emotional statements more than anything mm. So this is where, again, when we go back to inherent, we're we're talking about, in my mind, something like almost like metaphysical or spiritual, since we can't actually know what we're doing here as a species. We only take like big, strong guesses and then we adapt ourselves to those guesses and then we create like everything around those guesses, which is like really fair and like I think within reason, actually, because we want to survive as a species. And that belief in something bigger than ourselves has kept us going for all of this time. And so I'm not opposed to it because in Britney's society, there would be some version of um, deterioration in some of the systems we've brought into place, but it would hopefully adapt and replace into something different. You know, we'd have that relationship with it. It just wouldn't look like this world exactly, but it would look, I think, somewhat similar because we are a species of predictability in a lot of ways. Like you said, Sleeve, we create like hierarchies pretty naturally. And so I do think there'd be like this society, but a little bit different, just like every society seems to be. Society, like I always, people are always like, what's Croatia like? I'm like, the same as everywhere else. People are people everywhere. It's just a little different. It's just like a tweak here, a tweak here, but like people are people everywhere. And the good thing about that is that that means I don't feel too foreign in a foreign land. I feel like, oh, okay, it's just people, but different. But that's my sort of belief then that humans are inherently good, maybe because we are just so much, we're, we've proven time and time again that we are so capable. As much as we mess up, we really come back from it. So we might be a little slow, but overall we do pretty good. And so for me, as we steer away from what I would call evil, you know, sort of like the enjoyment of causing malicious and intended pain on others, as we move away from that, there's something about that. Now, of course, because like, you know, there's a thing called war in the world. You could argue that that's malicious and evil, but some part of war usually comes from ideology. And ideology is that little answer we give ourselves to justify the good we're doing in the world, right? So the road to hell is paved in good intentions. So my whole thing of radical acceptance when it comes to people like humans are going to human is that this is what we've adapted to do. And this is inherent in, in us, but also like are we even obligated to make prescriptions? Because what I'm afraid of and what I see often is people intend so much good, they cause so much more harm. And so my always my argument is like, even though we're inherently good in my mind, it's man, it's really like so much harm is still being done within that goodness. Any thoughts? That, that's why that's why I think it's important to that's why I feel it's so important to acknowledge that it's an emotional statement to say that something's good and bad because that tied to the that that it makes the prescription make sense okay it's I'm saying that you shouldn't do this because it just I, it horrifies me I don't want people doing this in in my society and I think that if we can say that like oh that if enough people are horrified by something then it makes sense that we shouldn't do it and um it makes sense because it contextualizes it within the people rather than objectifying it as a, like, we have to do this because this is what is right. And it's like separating it from the machines that are actively thinking it. And I so what about, I'm sorry, I was just going to say, so let me test this out a little bit. Um, so for example, child abuse, is that something that we simply have an emotional response to and that's why it's evil? Or is there something underlying an objective that actually like makes that action evil? Because if we were able to uh, uh, lose that emotional aversion towards that thing, would it suddenly become amoral simply because we didn't have that response? Well, like I, child abuse used to be normal in like older societies and stuff too. Like, like but did that make it good? Or did that well, make it? They really, would have said, the, yeah. Your question is about the emotional Agent response. Arena so he's saying that obviously we don't have an emotional response to it because we used to do it all the time. Right. I mean, I would argue there's a material fact where harming children is going to harm the next generation of people, which will make humanity worse for everybody. I think that that would be mm -hmm. the material reality right there. I don't think it's just an emotional response. I think part of our adaptation in recent generations has been to evaluate and seek to understand how things like childhood trauma, um, abuse, different experiences do have effects on us. And we are 
as a, as a species, obviously not every bubble, but um, a lot of these bubbles are looking to reduce that harm for future generations. I feel like it's a game. It's like a race for like whose civilization is going to give the best to its people. And the dilemma is like the moment we clarify its people, their people, our people, we are then making an argument that we are different, better and separate from other people. And my argument would be like we are all each other. And the higher you are on the introspections like level, you can have a relationship with less violence and more kindness because you'll realize there's almost no reason to be violent because it's just not efficient. But at the same time, the violence usually comes from us wanting to go, I think, back to our roots and our roots are our biology and our biology is our survivability and surviving makes sense. Like it's just an easier way to make it very easily knock someone out, destroy their whole civilization. Boom. Now we don't have to worry about getting to know them, adapting, changing culture, seeing them as people. And so I can understand that desire, but I would then argue mm. that this conversation about like inherent means that we are arguing with ourselves, us as an individual. This is really about us. It's not even about a society, right? And so That's I know That's definitely true. Yeah, like I don't feel evil, but I've definitely gotten messages from the internet saying like Britney's the most evil person who's ever existed. I was like, <laughs> fuck, if I'm evil, what is anyone else? Like what are we talking about? And even on the tribal level, what you're talking about, I think that that's actually one of the reasons why tribes are so strong. Uh, there's a book I love called The Selfish Gene. I'm going to be referencing books all day here. Love it. Um, but it talks about uh, not only the importance and selfishness of our own uh, need to procreate and pass along our genes, but our our desire to have our ideas supreme. And that's where a lot of tribalism comes from. There's the idea of mimetics, right? The idea that an idea can spread much faster than a gene. And that we can have many more ideas, such as religion, spread out throughout humanity at a far greater rate than we could have children. Uh, which is where a lot of our tribal ideas come from. The idea that our tribe has come up with the correct memetics, and therefore we can spread those memetics far and wide. Um, so tribes are actually kind of a natural extension of our own uh, selfish biology. And it's... It, See that, how that's it's where these ideas. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's adaptive. Incredibly. I, I love that one. Yeah, which is why we're so prone to it, which is why we love it so much. But it's also like the things that are adaptive that cause us the most self-deception, which is the same thing with tribalism. Like it's so adaptive to us. We love it so much, but it has caused us so much grief as a species. I mean, it causes each other so much grief for sure, especially people who are maladaptive outside of the tribal ideals. But the thing about it, you know, I talked about the criminal who doesn't seem to think that he's very bad because he uh, justifies it through his satiation of his hunger, that will to power. And it's that way on a mimetic level as well. And that's where I think that a lot of this tribalistic idea of us being right against other people can lead towards actions that I think that on an individual level, most of us would find pretty abhorrent. Um, but it does come back, even these ideas of tribalism come back to our biology, in my opinion, due to our need to spread our mimetic information. I mean, I think we have to have uh, an agreement overall on what is good and what is bad. Like generally, we're, we're I think naturally, we'll care about ourselves selfishly. Therefore, we care about our tribe. Those are the people that were around, our friends, our family, the people that we interact with. And we want protections for the people that we care about. But outside of that, we really don't care. Like, we might pretend we care or virtue signal we care or be, like, incentivized to care in some more abstract way. But, like, when it comes to, like, having an attachment to things, we're not sitting and reading obituaries all day, every day, crying over each and every person that's dying because... We have no attachment to them. We don't care about them. So Yeah, but do you think that there might be an instinctual level where if like we'd walked up to a stranger who we don't know at all and just punched him in the face, watched the no blood go down their nose and everything? Do you think that most people would have like a moral aversion to that, even if they have no connection to that person whatsoever? Wait, better better one would be a button a button that is you don't see the person, you push a button and it punches someone in the face for you and you never see them and you know Ooh. they're across the world. I love that. I think we're yes. definitely going to have an emotional aversion to it based on the surroundings that we grew up in, right? Like we're go we're not used to seeing violence in this way, so it ends up being shocking and ends up hurting us in some sort of way. Um, but we only abide by these like outside everywhere else with a bunch of people that we don't care about because we want everybody else who we don't care about to care about our 
uh, tribe and our people and us as well. And so like the consistency between tribes and between groups is really important. Like we all have to agree on how it is we're going to engage with one another. We can't just say like, I've got my own stuff. I got my own rules. I got my own ethics, uh, you know, my own code of conduct. I figured it out. Me and my tribe, me and my bubble, we got it. We know what we're doing. Y'all just leave us alone because you still have to engage with everybody else. You still have to understand how they want to be treated as well. And you still have to understand that lots of people are going to stigmatize you and look at you in a really negative light if all of a sudden you're going outside of your bubble and engaging in a way that they don't approve of. So the I, I think like it's almost uh, it's almost harmful to people, to themselves to try to like individualize things a little bit too much to where they're not taking into account the harms that will come outside of their own bubbles. Yeah. But when you say that your, 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 that ideology reinforces a tribalistic attitude where the other people are wrong and your attitude is right. Correct. So how are we doing yeah, that I'm already? Saying, say that again. Like, isn't that how the world works already? Yes. That's what I'm saying is that, that this is how it already is for the most part. Yes. Mm. Because I believe that there's something a little bit deeper going on. I mean, we know that we have mirror neurons and that we can empathize naturally with people around us. So if we see somebody who is in harm, we feel that, at least most of us do, unless we have antisocial personality disorder or something like that. We to generally are going to, we're generally going to witness uh, harm and pain of our fellow man. And we're going to feel that on an intuitive level. I don't think that that's something that's simply tribal. I think that that's something that's deeply ingrained in us as humans. It kind of has to be like there's reasons why we have these moments in history where we are so unempathetic. We do not care. We have people like Nazis doing horrible things to Jewish people for long periods of time because they're taught that these are the bad guys. These are the evil people. And it's OK to do all of these things to them. It's based on the socialization and whether or not you're taught to care about these people. I don't think that there is this inherent deeper thing that makes us do this automatically. I think we have that, to be socialized into these roles. What well, you're okay. talking about, I think, does have to be socialized, but I think our natural inclination oh. is to empathize with our fellow man. Well, wait, 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 yeah, that, I that would agree up. with the sleep on that. Sorry to interrupt you there, Smith. But Tom, cool. I think that as far as you're looking at like something like the Nazis being able to perform these horrendous actions, I think that they had to have a learned perception to see this group as less than human sure so let's go even farther the learned back part then. not the natural part i think if we go even farther back then we're just going to have a bunch of different tribes warring with each other incessantly never ending fighting with one another and killing each other and taking over new territories and raping new people and ravaging all sorts of different groups that seems to be like our history for the most part. What we're doing today and what we do now has been a very, very short stint in the human history. And so what we're doing is not, I don't think, representative of humans overall whatsoever. I think that the past, like other hundred thousand years where we're all killing each other nonstop is probably more closer to what we are doing or what we would want to do inherently. Tom, you've convinced me to change sides. And now I think that humans are good. OK, because of the Nazi metaphor, because I've realized because what was happening there was was they I'm were sorry, being guys, I'll be right back. the Jews are being scapegoated. OK, and and the way that that functions is it means you actually has how, it, there's something you hate within yourself. So if you are defining other people as evil, it means that you also think that you yourself are evil. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to see ourselves as good. Maybe maybe it's to, like necessity. We have to. Wait, what do you mean? Like you, we want to, we have to forgive ourselves. We have to, we have to see the goodness in ourselves and others or else we will lash out and hurt yeah, but, people. But this is again, like the, the like greater society thing where like, it is better for society if we view things this way. Right. Yes, where, yeah. Whereas if, 
not uh, if we're not sitting in societies, which societies are not natural. These are not like us caring about people outside of our own tribe. This is not natural. This isn't normal. This isn't what we normally do. And so I'm trying to take us back to like a more instinctual basis for ourselves where we are all interacting with one another and say, what did we do then? That was uh, what social constructs and social pressures and so social stigmas. These are not normal. We've built these things ourselves to fit society. And so take away society then. Society is the unnatural. Let's go to the natural part. What were we doing then? And it was not this. The, the we, Nazis were the more natural people in that we were situation. Doing, we, I think it, we were always doing the best we could do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Arena? I think at that point, oh, ahead, I don't think that answers though. I think if we look back like 60, 70 thousand years, right? Like really early humans at that point, the focus was just pure or mostly on survival, right? And yeah, mm -hmm. you did have your little tribe that you wanted to ensure the survival of, and you might have fought with other surrounding tribes for resources and stuff but that doesn't feel evil to me because you're doing it as a survival basis versus now that our societies are more developed and we have these different structures and community beliefs that are contrasting so on and so forth that's where we see behaviors like the Nazi example, that we're not doing this based on a survival need. We're doing this based on something that's more evil, really. Arena, did you want to say something? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think, firstly, a uh, slight disagreement with Tom in that I think everything we do is natural. I don't think humans can act outside of nature. If we were acting outside of nature, I think that would be supernatural. I mean, then there's the definition of artificial, meaning man-made, but that's another topic. But I was thinking about like, saying. yeah, but I was, but it's artificial as in it wasn't made by other animals. It was made by humans, but it was natural to us to move in that direction. But as I was thinking about you saying like, oh, in the past, we were nonstop killing each other. But also in the past, we were raising our children and playing with our babies and going gathering berries and sharing um, the Within catch tribe, from the yeah. hunt around, right? So I think it, only survivors it, out almost, of mudslides. <laughs> it's <laughs> like if we weigh like all of the bad that humanity did against the good, like if we were to quantify the good things against the bad things, would we not come out at a net neutral? <laughs> like we're just doing what we do, um, surviving. And and as Genevieve also pointed out, like with smaller tribes fighting for resources and now we at least in the developed world find less of a need to do that but at the same time i do think that um right now we think like you were saying like oh we don't care about these other people i think biologically we are not meant to live with or know more than like 150 people right? Mm -hmm. But we have access to millions. And I think that just goes beyond our biological capacity to actually care about that many people. Um, can I, you know, feel empathy and stuff? Yes. But can I actually, do I actually have the capacity to have them in my life? No. I think like, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong. Does anyone feel this way? Like if you watch a video of somebody dying, like in a horrific way, like, do you cry? Cause like I end up crying and like, I don't know this person, but like, I cry. You know what I mean? I don't know if I, I did have to go to therapy for this because I was crying over random people in the newspaper I didn't know because I was like, oh, my God, this is me because, like, I believe, like, we're all the same, you know? So I'm like, oh, my God. But it's, like, you crazy. You get a traffic can't... ticket and have to watch red <laughs> asphalt, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, like, it's unreasonable, right, from a survival perspective to literally drown yourself, like, in other people's pain when you have to survive as an entity. So um, in that way, like, does do we – are we – because I don't – again, I think there's, like, this little bit of – in American society – um. Uh, like a pride in being like sociopathic almost like i don't care that other people mm. suffer i'm very yeah. strong and i'm like yes like you don't want to drown in the empathy but you also and people have high and low empathy but like also like people are people 
like even the Nazis were that... allegedly very struggling to fulfill their orders. And so there's like some stories about how Nazis were basically alcoholics to get through the Holocaust themselves. And I believe that. Like I believe some of them probably very much struggled doing what they had to do. Mm -hmm. You know? Yep. And I think that what you're talking about is something that people strive for in the journey to avoid pain because that's a very natural part of the human existence mm -hmm. is exposing ourselves to other people, feeling pain for other people. I mean, we've all probably lost a family member, at the very least a pet, and knowing the, the pain that that causes is just very guttural and visceral. And so we oftentimes say things like, if I just didn't care about anybody or anything, then this wouldn't hurt as bad. Uh, but that's not what we want to admit to other people. We're just like, I'm not hurt by anybody. Mm -hmm. I'm not hurt by anything. And it's mm -hmm. almost like a mission to somatize oneself against the human condition which is to empathize with ourselves and to empathize with other people and so you know you have like that goal to just be like hey none of this affects me and that's why it's it almost seems impressive to other people like wow you're not impacted by these human experiences that's just crazy to me i think that's what most people would say but you know there's also i don't know i think that online you're definitely right there is like this need to kind of protect oneself and so they try to yeah. tell themselves things like that yeah, I think it's more than just um, not wanting to be hurt by the thing itself. I think it's that if you are empathetic and you let that out, then you are vulnerable to other people and other people can use that and hurt you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of protective factors that go into this. Just like Tom was saying, like we can't literally be mourning everyone because it just does it's not you're causing more harm to yourself, right? By like trying to cry for every person that's ever died. It's like, okay, stop. And then at the same time, why are we even in this situation in the first place? Like I believe um, Arena said it, like I think we are nature and everything we do is nature. And so everything we act out is nature, including introspection, including when we rise above our biology and we evoke free will, that is within our nature to be curious. It is within our nature to evolve. It is within our nature to inherently be introspective, whether or not we actually get a chance to be or we have access or tools to be, we still have a possibility of it within ourselves as a human species and so a part of me thinks like we are just animals we just have a different relationship now that they're doing studies on the consciousness of plants it's like very interesting to argue about whether or not humans are truly that unique or if it's just the experience we're having with what we define as consciousness and i think that's what's interesting because like you and i could say i would never hurt any of you like gosh please don't put me in a position where i would ever Thank have to defend me. myself against you right like that's my fear is that i would have to be put in a position where like tom goes crazy and he comes at me and i'm like <laughs> and like i don't want to do that right like i don't want to do that so of course in my mind i'm like don't put me in this position and as long as we never put each other in these positions like we should be good but the problem is is like we put ourselves in these positions to hurt each other and the question is like why do we do that is that the inherently evil part or is that the inherently good part is that the survival part or is that just like our curiosity getting the better of us is that like which part is that it's too complicated. Okay, it's too complicated. I'm gonna, I'm gonna freak out. No, it's just, it's just, so, no. Like that's why I brought it all the way to childhood. That's why that's what was I was focused on with the introduction. Because, because that's simple. It's way simpler than all of society and like social media and like how we like engage in like, like governments and like geopolitics and. True. True. But it can so, come back to one very base thing, which is just hunger. Like I said, when I heard Irina talking about that, you know, the natural human condition, she was talking about protecting yourself from like other tribes and things like that. That can be like a natural extension of humanity. I think the most base level is hunger and how much you're willing to let that hunger encroach on other people. Uh, you know, there's a idea called the will to power, which is often misunderstood. People think that will to power simply means that you are willing to exert power on other people. But it's really just as simple as how much are you willing to exert on other people to satiate the natural hunger that we all have? And that's where I think a lot of these like natural human inclinations come from. It's just we have that base understanding that we want to eat and how how many people are we willing to like sacrifice for that? How many and are we willing to like look at ourselves and be like, we're hurting other people and I don't maybe need to eat as much as that. But fuck it, I'm going to do it anyways. And I don't care what these other people think about that. That seems to be where you're getting into like the universal understanding of harm and evil and bad. Um, so I'm just curious what people on this panel might think about that. Do you think that that's like the most base urge that we have that makes us encroach on others? I mean, that's kind of what I was trying to get at is that like uh, Genevieve was talking about earlier that when we're bringing up like 70,000 years ago, they're they're warring with a bunch of other people over necessity. And I think that that's within our DNA, that's every animal has to struggle to survive and that the actions that they take because of this are 
are just barely very baseline. They they have to do these things instinctually. And so I'm saying that <clears throat> those things that we want to do that are instinctual, that is like the evil part of us and that selfishly we choose not to do those things and that we don't want others to do these things. That like when we talk about natural, generally we're saying that these are things that are not man-made or don't have like human interference with it, right? The obviously morality, uh, societal norms, culture, stigmas, these are all man-made. These are all um, social constructs that we've created for ourselves to limit ourselves on what it is that we're going to do. Because not only, I, I, I'm not going to go like it, punch somebody, not just because, uh, not because I don't want to hurt them, because sometimes I do want to hurt people. Sometimes I have Oof. this like this primal urge to yeah. go freaking hurt somebody. Yeah. But I'm not going to because other people will see that, that maybe I do like. Maybe people that I do want to still engage with. And they're going to see that, and they're not want to engage with me. I'm a red flag now. I'm somebody that's dangerous. They don't want to chill with me anymore. And so the only reason that I'm not punching this person is because I still want all of those other people to continue engaging with me anyways. And I don't want the negative consequences of that. But do I inherently want to do this? Yes. Like I, I, <clears throat> I will have a need to punch somebody sometimes and still have to pull back from that because the need to have all of the other resources from all of the other people within my tribe is more important. It, it like, so if you ever, I, if you ever like watched a bunch of kids or worked in a daycare, you like, uh, like you'll see them, like they can't share, they don't know how to do it. So one kid wants a toy and another kid takes it and he's like, <laughs> and he, like punches them or something. And, uh, like that, if that, like for some, if you have a good like parent or like a good role model, um, like they can teach you like how to share and that, that, that'll benefit you. No, like, look, no, look, you, you can share. And then you're, you're not, it's going to be better. And you'll have less of that. I think you, you can teach people to have less of that evil compulsion because they see the, the benefit to them. And, and they have a role model early on where they learn that we, we, I, can, I can actually do something that's not hurtful to them. And that's good for me. So me caring about you is good for me. Caring about you is, is now a um, adaptive trait. So God, this feels so over intellectualized. I feel like so many kids on just a base level, if they punch someone and see the blood come down their face, they're going to be like, oh, my God, what have I done? Probably. You know, like, I think that most humans are going to have that response. And that's actually well, you don't think that most kids are going to feel that response. If they did you have brothers else and no. sisters growing up, did I what? Yeah, you I have have brothers sister. and sisters growing up. Yeah, okay, I had brothers and sisters. We got into fights all the time. We would severely hurt one another sometimes. And like the only uh, upsetting part about it is when you get sent to your room afterwards. Hey, I'll tell you, my parents never told me like, I remember one time me and my sister were arguing, kind of pushing each other. And I nobody ever told me like not to punch anybody else. I threw a punch at my sister. I hit her in the arm and she started crying. It's still one of, my parents never knew about this. They never told me it was right or wrong. That's still one of the darkest memories I have in my psyche is remembering the harm that I brought to my sibling. That was completely natural. It didn't come to me like through anybody teaching me anything. That was just me seeing how my actions impacted somebody else and knowing what it feels like to be in that position. I think that that's, that's much more fundamental. Coming out actually is what that's my is. misogyny, right? Okay. I think well, there's a spectrum of people when it comes to empathy, though. Some people are much more empathic than other people. Yeah, yeah, I what do if, agree with that, but I do think that there's like kind of a baseline that most people exist under. I don't, I don't think, think that it's you that need baseline to tell... though, because I also had really, yeah, I don't think it's that baseline at all. No, I don't. I think no, we if, mostly have you guys, to be socialized. You guys were all punching it is your siblings a as a kid, and you were just like, meh, true, meh. true. You know, the but bruises, the bleeding. You were just like, I don't yes. care, whatever. Yeah, like yes. I have a brother who we would be killed. Yeah, I'm in a room with psychopaths. Oh winners my God. are losers, right? My audience is saying, like, what about winning and losing? What if it's just about, like, we want to be winners? What if it's the pride? What if it's not the fear of being a loser, but the pride of being the winner? Like, what about mm -hmm. that part that is inherent to our biology? Well, and enjoying watching the other person lose as well and watching them suffer and okay, we all don't pointing have to in their face and telling them they own, suck. But maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Uh, uh. There, there's one example that's like come into my head. Like, I can't imagine feeling that way. Like, just like seeing someone like, all right, I punched them in the face. They're crying. Clearly, I'm the victor here. All right. They lost. I won. W weave in the chats. All right, guys. Um, Like, I could I can't quite see but most that people happening. don't do that without some like passionate reason, though. Um, so it feels so I, justified. It's not just a purely evil act. 
So and therefore, the, 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 like you have the reaction some, is, oh, one at a time, people, one you know? at a time. <laughs> yeah, because what I was going to say, there is an example I can think of. And I gave this example online. It made a lot of people get very angry at me. I was thinking of the example of, let's say there are two guys who are competing for the same girl. Now, if one of those guys ends up getting the girl and the other guy ends up losing out in this amorous chase, uh, the other guy who lost, there is a sense of satisfaction where if you knew that you obtained like the romantic partner the other one wanted, you kind of want that guy to feel the sting of that. You kind of mm -hmm. want him to feel like, damn, I competed for the same woman and I lost. I'm the loser. That guy is superior. Um, I really think that that's something I see play out in like clubs. I see like, you know, guys and friend groups even like playing that one out where they just were going for the same romantic partner and they wanted the other guy who lost to know that they lost and that that girl is now his. Um, somebody told me that I was being a psycho for that one, but I don't think that that, I think that's like one of the more clear cut examples because in sexual selection, I think that that's much more black and white. You know, there are winners and losers and that kind of stuff. As far as like causing harm to other people through physical violence, I think that that's a little bit different when it comes to more baseline competition. I can think of absolute examples where we want the other person to suffer because we won. I was, but I think um, as hierarchical wait, beings, like we want to we want to harm others in order to climb up hierarchies as well. I think that that's probably pretty natural for us within tribes as well. And that we want to be the strong dominant one, the one that other yeah. women want to be with. And these are part of the ways that we perform and, uh, and would show women that we were the one that they would want to mate with and all these other things. I think that like uh, all of even people that we care about, sometimes we would, uh, happily hurt them as long as there's uh like positive uh outcomes for us all right yeah, Arena, it's, go it's, ahead. let's late wait arena's tried to speak a few times let's go okay. girl unmute yourself all right <laughs> um i was thinking about the idea of kids being um kind of empathic i actually made a video about this um about how we actually have to, I think, learn to have the capacity to love because kids are kind of little sociopaths, but we love them and they're precious and they're innocent, but they are kind of little sociopaths. I I think I remember actually as a child, like, and as a teenager as well, like having that very self-centered, egoistic kind of way of being, very selfish. Um, I have a sister and we would fight, not physically, uh, but over resources. Um, I would absolutely go ballistic if she stole my stole my clothes. Yeah, stole my clothes, borrowed my clothes. Um, we would, that was our biggest um, thing that we would fight about. Um, but I think what the but i still think kids are right people are neutral right and i think the because we are social animals the development comes from um how adaptive how receptive are you to the guidance of how to um adjust your way in a social in a social setting right if we take um hypothetically um a human that so not a feral child because that is a human that needed that social interaction and didn't get it. But if we take, if we imagine the human as an animal that is not a social animal, like a tiger, then you wouldn't need that guidance. And then you would just grow into the appropriate, you know, survival human animal self that you would be. Dang. So nobody thinks that we just have a natural ability to empathize as children, huh? No, no, no. I do. I, I feel do. like we do. It's on a spectrum. It's got to yeah, be do. like, look, coming from a family yeah. of nine kids and seeing Yeah, because maybe grow we're up, talking like, about where we draw the line. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do think some children are definitely more inherently mm -hmm. like empathetic than others. Like I have a brother that we call like low empathy brother because like even though he's really high on sympathy, he's so low on empathy. And so it takes him a long time. Like he'll do good, but like not for empathy, but for values. And I feel like I do good because of empathy much more. Like I'm definitely the cry sister. Like I'll just cry over everyone's pain all the time. And so I'm just like, oh my gosh. And then I'll pretend I'm like a sociopath. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't even have feelings. And then I'm like, oh, this is such a cope. And I'm coping because like I've been that way. My mom says since I was a child, like Brittany would just like go up to people and be like, are you in pain? And I'm like, oh, I'm crazy. You raised a crazy child. But what she, I just think we had different relationships with empathy and sympathy. That's all that it is. So I do think some children have more empathy than others. And even Tom said something that was distinct to my brain where he said, like, I think Tom has a more traditional hierarchical desire, even in, like in the man bubble, like Tom has a more desire to be like sought at, at after like mates or he cares about society and how society reacts to him. 
I don't think about society that much. I think about how to be myself without making society angry at me, but not because I want them to like me, but because I don't want them to hurt me, which is different. But that's the same. I'm it's, saying it's kind of the same thing. Is it? I think it, yes, it's the same. The, the like when we're talking about not having other people in your tribe, this is going to be harmful to you. You want other people around you. You want to have friends and family who still care about you without any of them. That would be harmful to you. And so like you still it, it, it is both. It's going to it's going to have a mixture of both to some extent. What is a tribe? Like what are we what are we calling a tribe, right? Because you know, in my friends, I family people that you actually care about. So when we're talking about the fact that you don't go and cry about everybody in the newspaper, we're talking about the people who you do cry over. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to ask is because I was trying to delineate between society and tribe with you. Um, it sounded like you were talking more about the close people in your life and how that impacts your actions. Me? Yeah, Tom? that's why I kept oh. naming like friends and family is oh, to Tom's say that there. like, mm -hmm generally like we care about ourselves first then we care about our tribe after that and then we'll care about greater society on top of that but each one of these are going to come down generally to our own selfish wants and needs yeah do you think that it's possible to love somebody else like more than yourself in this hierarchy equation yes i have 100 percent. yes Okay, yeah, because you put you put self at the top right here. And for most people, that's I would agree, because I, I think that the number one thing, one of the questions that Brittany asked in the uh, initial questions was, uh, what is one thing that humans are inherently? Uh, and I believe that humans are inherently self-interested. That's mm -hmm. not necessarily a bad thing, but I do think that that's where like most of our convictions come from. Uh, for example, uh, I had thought about, you know, I talked about the memetics of a society, the memetics of a tribe and how that plays out in our need to express ourselves. But also I wrote a sentence that I thought was like interesting. Uh, I put, humans are, inher are inherently going to human. And I know this because human, as a human, you are constantly surrounded by humans and thus only have a reference point and deep bi biological inclination to be human. Mm -hmm. You know, that really seems to be where our self-interest comes from is just this deeply human thing right here that's only educated by other humans. And the most human thing we know is ourselves. So most of our empathy, most of our values, everything is going to eventually come from us, whether it become love for our children, love for our friends, love for our communities. All of that has to come from an understanding of human, which starts with us. Mm -hmm. I still think, though, that it, even when we're talking about loving someone greater than yourself, this is just more so of a saying. I still think it's going to come down to something selfish in the end. You still get joy. You still get stimulation out Eudemonia. of providing for them. Yes, out of like sacrificing for them and even giving your own life for them to some extent will give you this self, right. uh, you know, feeling of self-righteousness in doing so. And so I that's, still think in the end, it's, yeah. That's the one I wanted to explore actually, is the idea <laughs> of a parent who's willing to sacrifice their life for their children. You know, so I guess some people would say that that's also a self-interested act because you're pass you're keeping your genetics alive by doing that action. So it's still a selfish act because you just simply want to have your genes survive, and that's why you're doing it. But even um, more so. than genes, like I would say that is my mo like Brittany's moral obligation through her values to up like uphold her values, which means like my child has to be first. Which is interesting because like even my dad recently said that to me. He goes, "I love you and your mom more than I even love myself," and I was like, "Yeah, but." you only love us because we're a part of yourself and like mm. i get what he's saying though he's saying yes. like i will give my life for both of you and i'm saying i would love to give my life for you but my dad wouldn't let me sacrifice my life for him he'd be like what are you doing like i am the parent like i have an obligation not but just like and it's not even like the scientist like he's not thinking like genetics he's thinking like i i am your father like i uh, my obligation is to protect and love you Brittany. and so he's thinking about it almost like romantically and i want to know how much like our idea around romance comes and plays into even our relationship with evil because i do think some people have like a romantic relationship with this even this idea of evil because it's such a fantasy it's so far from for some of us like what we think is evil in one of our more like privileged everyday lives is like somebody using a word out of context because it's old by 10 years years into in, in relation to like what's socially acceptable so like what does evil even mean and like do we even like spend too much time thinking about it instead of thinking about improving on already the harm that's happening like do we spend too much time fantasizing about evil that we don't spend enough time like doing good is kind of my question i guess 
I like this because I'm always imagining like in hell in the movies, it always looks way more fun than heaven. You know, everybody's like dancing, doing drugs, partying, banging people like, you know, it's always like the fun place in movies because there is this flirty, fun kind of element that's mischievous and cool to evil. And why why we as humans kind of have that inclination where it's like, ooh, being bad is kind of good. You know, like, where does that feeling come from? I'm genuinely curious, like, and I I, th I have my own theories, but I'd like to hear everybody else. Honestly, Compe I, think competition. Well, I think it's partly yeah. because, like, the two, like, evil and good define each other. They define and afford each other. You can't separate the two from each other. So there is yeah, an element my question of is, why good does, and why evil. Why does evil and seem and more fun? And good. Competition. I think it's competition. Because, yeah. because, like, so, like, famous people, like, are all, like, mentally ill. Like there, there's like data and statistics on this. Like like people that are famous personalities, people that we look up to, they're all like mentally ill. People that are like CEOs, like they they all have like certain like messed up traits and stuff. And uh, like I I would fantasize. I remember in being in high school, um, I would fantasize about like uh, I, I I hope I become a sociopath. You know, I, I hope that I hope I become a sociopath. Then I'll be like one of the winners in society. Mm -hmm. Um. So and I and I I met and knew this guy and I was like I I would like try to find like mentally ill people to surround myself with even, and uh, um, I don't know if evil feels more good though I don't I really don't I mean it's very salient like often it's like very like you know real in our face and like we really want it for whatever reason like like temptation you know that idea comes in to play but like. I don't know, and I think about the thing, the good, good things that feel good. Like to me, those feel like so much better. Like on such a deeper level than anything like evil and the salience of that. Yeah, like, yeah, no, that's I... like so fake and so like easily like eaten and shoot through you know what i mean i don't know like the good know, is something that's solid the good yeah. is far more wholesome it's better for you and in the long run it's going to nourish your garden far better i would argue but there's something kind of sexy about evil there's just something yeah. kind of fun something kind of naughty yeah like that salient kind of yeah. makes yeah. you want to dab your toes in the evil every now and then it makes you and horny yeah <laughs> no, I there you go I, I, the horniness is good i think that's just, uh, a really good example evil? of I like no no he's saying that the <laughs> evil makes you kind of horny okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Tom, it does no, it does arena. absolutely Tom in the arena I think a, a really good example to think of is like being in a relationship with somebody that you love like that's at home you have this very deep connection with this person but that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that there's not this desire to go outside of that and have that taboo where you cheat and it's very dangerous and it's something you're not supposed to be doing that like going outside of what's normal for you is generally what's exciting right if we go to water parks we go to roller coasters we're doing things that are exhilarating that are very rare for us and that are going to get our adrenaline flowing and so i think that taboos are things that we think of as bad or things that we just don't ever really nobody ever does because they're dangerous to to some extent and so because they're things that we never experience when we do them like it's it's a lot more fun but after a while heroin is kind of obnoxious it's not a whole lot of fun the hundredth 200th time you do it you know now it's just kind of obnoxious at this point so i think like what when it is a taboo when it is rare it's still exhilarating it's still a lot more fun but I think that that's like the main thing that you're getting out of it is going outside of your comfort zone and doing something different. The very right. first humans, Adam and Eve did it. They ate the forbidden fruit. Smith fired. <laughs> okay, Arena and then me. <laughs> Go. Okay. I was going to say, um, I think Smith, I, I was only listening. You brought up the idea of um, competition in this discussion, right? And so, um, and then Tom, you expanded further on it's the taboo. So it's not necessarily the evil, right? Like, um, I think of the edgy aesthetic, you know, like the goth, the mm -hmm. subcultures, the punk subcultures, and they're not evil. They're like some church pearl clutching church ladies might disagree, but what um, they're really exploring is, you know, pushing the boundaries of the bubble um, and it can be done in healthy ways. So I think it's um, exploring the bounds of normativity that is appealing to us and not necessarily evil, although evil is also outside of the bounds of normativity. Well, let me give you an example, you a controversial one. Oh, go I ahead, think. Jen. You, yeah, I was going to say, here, let me think I, of I, an evil example right here. Do you think that cheating on your partner is evil? If I did it. 
<laughs> if I did it. Uh, <laughs> sorry. I think uh, it's Arbina, a sin which can lead to evil. <laughs> yeah, do you think that uh, if, if cheating on your partner is evil, that's one thing that I think like a lot of people, there's a lot of people who do that one, you know, that's a temptation that they're like, you know, my wife, she's so wholesome, my family is so great, we have such a good nourishing environment here, but oh my god, if I could just get a little bit of strange on the side, and there are two very different mentalities with the wife and the mistress, right? Mm -hmm. There's like the kind of sinful fun of the mistress versus the wholesome good of the wife. You know, so that would be one example that I could think of off the top mm -hmm. of my head. Jen, did you have a thought you wanted to share? Just that I really was wanting to say something kind of similar to what Ari had brought up. That I think it's like novelty or like pushing the boundaries of what's accepted that we find sexy and appealing, not necessarily evil things but things that are maybe just more uncommon mm. okay okay I, wait wait really fast and then smith i'll go and then you can go i think i think about evil the way um like the people think of the ring in lord of the rings which is like this thing even though it's evil i think i'm the one who can tame it and then mm -hmm. the temptation comes from the desire to like instill in the ego some sort of like godlike behavior so then when we play with evil we're really playing with temptation and then we're like playing with our ego which is why i think humility leads to joy and when you have mm -hmm. the right amount of humility you deny evil and its temptations and therefore you get the reward of joy but for lo so long as you like think you can master the ring you 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 can't master humility so you can't master joy and therefore evil leads to more harm than good but evil is a part of nature and so whether or not you engage with it is also a part of your desire of nature to be curious and to, to uh, give into the ego which is why again when you have the gift of introspection on any degree you can at least start the stepping stones of saying well hold up bros like this thing that's so evil what is it really going to give me and if you can't think ahead you're going to touch the stove and figure it out hopefully you're going to learn the lesson right Okay, so that's my thought. Smith, go. I, okay, yeah, there's go. Okay, two, two things. Okay, one, one like, I, 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 I'm getting mildly frustrated. Yeah, I'm getting pissed off at everybody. <laughs> that, um, that, like, when, when we, because of the word evil, um, it's kind of, it's, it's like we're all, every time each one of us uses it, we're all using it a little bit different. And, and it, I don't think we're going to be able to fix that. But, like, I just wanted to say that. Do you want to define um, it? For me, it, for me, it's something that, um, I did that upsets me that I don't like. Like they, you I know, think all like, of us, for the most part, had the same definition. I, I, from what I understood, I felt like you were the one with a bit of a different one. Well, if that's the case, well, that's why I'm pissed off. You know? <laughs> okay. Maybe. Anyway. Gonna... Oh, sorry. Um, is there okay. is Wait, there such Smith, a thing as an finish? objectively evil action? Um, if you ask me, yeah. But if you ask Brittany, yeah. And if you ask Tom, yeah. But I mean, I like I, I don't know about like objectively, uh, like. No, like I mean, my, how I feel. I, if I'm angry, I'm objectively angry, and if I objective, I objectively think something is evil. But I don't think evil in itself is an objective thing without a human. I, I mean, I think we're all basing these on, uh, like, even the way that a lot of us defined it, we're based on subjective markers. Things like, you know, it being unimaginable, malicious, without empathy, like the, these sorts of things that are aren't objective markers one way or the other it, anyways so, so 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 when in this conversation like right now when we're talking about being attracted to things that are evil then what we are saying is we're attracted to the things that we ourselves think are wrong right that's a philosophy question right because like evil you could argue is anything that brings on an immense amount of harm or has intentional harm or that deteriorates the soul which sounds religious deteriorates the goodness of joy or like yes we're putting like a a definition on it based off our own perception of reality right if we we're all in comas there'd be no reality to perceive so like well like we are, you you could you well, can have a definition of that just real quick I, I think broader than that we would say taboos that we're like attracted to taboos yeah. evil or like bad things or evil things happen to be taboos as well but yeah. not all things that are taboo Ooh. are necessarily evil well no no i know i think they all are evil if you actually believe in the taboo like so i i think a 14 year old doesn't have a philosophical usually like a deep philosophical understanding or, or conception of these things but they will perceive things as evil um and those will be things that they just think are wrong because they're told basically that that it was wrong and, and they're like okay i'm not i'm not supposed to be uh i'm, I'm not supposed to like you i'm not supposed to go out and like 
I, I think like you know a, a small child is gonna is gonna like start like freaking out if you start doing adult things around them like so like they they, they they've they've been like coached that you know when if adult starts doing this you're not supposed to, that that's no you're not supposed to be okay with that and stranger danger and they're and if you start doing that they're gonna be like this is wrong this is wrong it's not they're not having a philosophical discussion about it they just know that that's wrong because they're told and they believe it well that's most people i would argue it doesn't have to do with children but like okay yeah but sure, like, sure what is wrong and what is evil are two different things but before arena do you want to get in on this or did you well i have something to say yeah. okay, oh i was next. gonna say um i think the Mm, the the variety or the kind of changing of the definition is when we're talking about evil as an act versus evil as a human right because like i think mm -hmm. a human who cheats or cheated isn't necessarily evil but then the act of cheating is bad <laughs> or See? we have this oh, a yeah. little bit in our discord conversation where I always differentiate, and this is a non-human example, but I always differentiate if I have a kitty who's being bad, right? I'll tell them, you know, you're not a bad kitty, but that was a bad kitty behavior. And I think the same can be done for humans, mm -hmm. right? Like a, a human could participate in an evil activity but that might not necessarily make them an evil person on the whole. Yeah, yeah that like goes really right along with like what I was going to say. Wait, yeah. Sorry. Okay, Harmony, go, go ahead. Oh, yeah. No, thank you. Sorry. I was, it just goes along with what I was going to say. Like, I think that evil is a process. It's not like a, a thing. It's not a human. It's a process that we participate in. It's a parasitic process on the good. That's adaption, you know? So it's like getting into the machinery of our adaption, we get into these um, feedback loop patterns with behaviors um, and they get into this kind of like narrowing where it's like, our, like and, and again, addiction comes to mind as, you know, an addict <laughs> myself, like you get into this like narrowing relationship with the thing where that's the only thing that's salient to you and your world becomes like very small. And so it's like, it didn't start as an evil thing, but eventually it's like the pattern that you get into it has like such salience to your life that it's the only thing, you know, that that process, that's what evil is. It's the process. It's not like, would you say it's a relationship? Yeah. Like evil is yeah. a relationship. Like it doesn't exist on yeah. its own. It really, it re mm. only exists in a relationship in re to something. Whether it's yeah, like it's participatory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. participatory. Exactly. Participatory learning of a uh, lack of agency. Exactly. Which begs the question now, because a lot of us, like in the debate space, like you guys are arguing pers like um, prescriptions, you're arguing like people should or ought to go in a direction. And that's, you know, the idea is hopefully to get away from evil, but then evil is a relationship you're having. So if no one was engaging in evil, where would it come from? And then if it comes from engagement, how do we mitigate engagement? And then if it's, you know, that's the convert, that's the way my brain works it out is like, what is evil, right? And I, again, like, if it's a relationship something's ha someone's having with something and i think of evil as like again it's so it's such a strange thing because i think there's evil in animal kingdoms and eve e in the animal like dog and cat kingdom and ours but it's not evil in the same way like it's evil in a sense because it's so beyond like it's so far from joy that's how i would look at it anything furthest from joy is more evil or bad but like what is joy joy is like harmony and peace like they, if you go biblical, they'll say like Adam and Eve before they ate the apple, like the animals walked amongst Adam and he was friends with the animals and the animals, they were like, they weren't attacking each other. They weren't eating Adam. You know what I mean? And so it's kind of like using that biblical source of saying, what is joy? It's peace. And then how do we get the closest to that? Right. And the furthest from joy would be evil. But then what is the, do any of us really, do we know what the furthest from joy is? Have we ever seen that kind of evil? Even though we reference it in history, we could also make a really good case for why it happened and why it's going to happen again. Yeah, I don't. I actually, so yeah, I, I I don't think evil can can objectively exist. It's just our perception of something as being that. But you know, it, that isn't a real thing. You know, so I, I think when you say something's evil, you're saying I, like, and from when I say something's evil, I'm I'm like saying I am loading this because like I'm just like I'm saying like black box. You know, like it's. 
that's evil. Mm. It, uh, it's not like a totally rational, but. Mm -hmm. Sleeve, are you raising your hand? Yeah, I think I have an equation. I'm just going to throw it out to the panel, see how this one fares. Um, so evil seems to be three components to me. Uh, I was just listening to everybody talk. I just thought, can I nail down something that like we're all talking about here? So one is it has to be harmful to yourself or another person. Two, you have to know and understand that harm. You have to be able to see that harm being done to either yourself or another person. And the third component is you have to choose to ignore that knowledge and continue to do that. That would be an equation that I would personally consider evil. Uh, can anybody refute that? It's tons of that things that people think what I gave as well. Yeah. Yeah. But that's where I disagree because there's tons of things that people think are evil that are not harmful to anybody. Well, if you know that somebody is being harmed, let's say it was even just like I said the word blue, the word blue psychologically harmed that person. I wouldn't know unless they told me. Right. So if they told me, hey, when you say that word, it causes me deep psychological harm. You know, like I could continue to be like, all right, blue, 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 until they started to feel anguish over that fact. I think that that would be a bad action in that case uh, because you are evil. choosing to do something that would hurt them. Uh, well, yeah, that's the thing. Is it truly evil, though? Because I think, that the, like you said, it's a sliding scale. I think yeah. it's bad on one end and evil all the way on the other one. I, I'm reticent to call that one evil, but it is bad, I would you say. You know, it's interesting, though, because now that I'm married, I live with a person, and we both have, like, weird neurodivergent we habits. And if we tell each other, like, oh, just so you know, when you do X action, X things happens to me. And I would appreciate it if, like, you wouldn't do this um, – around me or something like that and then i went and heard that and went do it anyways do it anyways do it anyways do it. eventually like that would be just like evil in my brain because i'm mm -hmm. telling the person that is like my soulmate the person that i told that i would like do life with hey thank you for choosing to do life with me i'm gonna torture you for the rest of your life <laughs> like what <laughs> yeah like, that... it harms yeah you know the harm mm -hmm. and you are choosing to partake in the harm right. anyways like right. that now, seems to be the equation and in and that... in this example it's somebody who you have made a commitment to love exactly. and protect and cherish exactly. and respect and all these things. Exactly. And so the, what, what's interesting though is like, you know when pride comes in though and someone goes like, it's not that big of a deal. Like, why can't you just take a joke? It's like, okay, are you having the cognitive dissonance or is your fear coming in? Are you now not evil, but you're bad because you're having a cognitive dissonance with the information? Because it feels like I am processing it, saying it, consenting to it, and then I'm breaking the consent boundary, which tells me I, the fault is on me. But if I'm dealing with like a parent who goes, oh, what do you mean you, you have borderline personality disorder? Are you saying I wasn't a good parent? And I'm saying, well, it could have been better. And they're saying, oh, what does that mean? I, I, you know, they double down, they get defensive. I, a part of me is right. like, you're not evil, dude, but you're, you're being like, you're kind of like a bad parent, but also you were a yeah. great parent, but also. But the part of that is also the understanding of the harm once again, because they might not believe in the harm. They True. might say like, what are you talking True. about? That's not harm. Are you crazy? And in that case, I don't necessarily think that that person's evil because they don't have the knowledge that they are harming someone mm -hmm. because they don't think that's harm. Mm -hmm. um, so, so they can be can bad be a... without the knowledge of the harm they're doing. But you have to have that knowledge right. in order to be evil. Mm, there well, we go. Yes. Sometimes a problem that I have a lot is where we'll talk about something being wrong and then we'll have somebody say, yeah, but I think I could understand why they would do that. Uh, and I, I think it seems like a lot of people are, will change their opinion on whether or not something is right or wrong based on whether or not they can like <clears> – <throat> sympathize with the thought process which i think is is generally like very different from the way that we think of right and wrong we we normally think of these based on the outcomes and what's happening to the person whether or not there's harm but the but if we can think like oh it kind of makes sense why they would do this thing even though it still had this really harmful outcome and they may have seen that coming i can understand why they did it anyways and so now i don't think it's as big of a deal and I, I, I try, I have trouble weighing those two against each other. Cause I don't think they're the same thing. I don't think I can say something is now moral or not immoral just because I can understand your thought process, but it doesn't mean that it's totally useless. Right. I think probably pe people with BPD probably run into this all the time where like a lot of times somebody they'll do something wrong. They'll hurt somebody. But then afterwards, people will be like, oh, but they have BPD, you know, so like kind of 
kind of makes sense. And it's like, okay, if it makes sense, which one are we weighing above the other? And like, does this actually change anything for us? Like, is it, is it now because they have a mental illness and we can understand maybe why they did this more so now? Does this like change the outcome in any way? It seems like it's still bad, but it's able to, but you're at least able to put context on bad in that regard. You're able to be like, all right, well, that was a bad thing, but bad things happen. And so therefore that's something that I have to adapt to. As a matter of fact, I would say that's a non-maladaptive thing. That's an adaptive thing to be able to understand the imperfect nature of our world, but that still makes it a bad action. Yeah, I don't like think if person somebody out takes $20 out of my bag when it's sitting like on a chair at the coffee shop or whatever it's it's bad that they took money out of my purse i get why they did it <laughs> they, why yeah whether they're like well i haven't eaten in three days you know um yeah. okay well i get that but it's i wrote still this example down bad <laughs> yeah it was pretty like, common with like blm rioters as well right like their buildings are burning down places are getting looted and then they a lot of people turn around and say like yeah but come come on like look at their conditions like uh, of course they're gonna do that and it's like but does that yeah does that, that doesn't make it, it not bad though, though exactly it's just because you can Hamas. empathize with it Hamas. <laughs> yeah that's I mean, that's, yeah it's kind of what yeah, i was yeah. thinking of as well yeah well, that's the conundrum, right? Is like, again, I think we have to radically accept, understand, and then problem solve. But I think what we often do is like see something, react to something, problem solve without ever understanding why they got there. Because, quote, it's never like it's impossible to think how they get here. They must just be evil. They must just be bad. They must just be animals. They must be inhumane. They must like you like it's almost like monsters. We separate them from us as if we're not capable of doing these things as if evil doesn't have access to us, right? Smith, is your hand up? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, actually, because, okay, so that's why I'm, I'm moving back. So I now I think humans are evil. I think <laughs> we have to define humans av as evil, because if if we are, are going to define any action as evil, um, then what we are doing is we're putting people in a separate category from ourselves. And we have to define ourselves as evil to have empathy for people and to have that process. Mm. No, we have access to evil, in, in meaning we have the ability to do evil, but it doesn't mean we always have to engage in evil. Just like we have the access to yeah. good or to do good. So it doesn't mean we're evil, and it's not inherently evil. I think, oh, mm, You can't okay, fight it. You're saying. You're you can't saying, fight it. <laughs> mm, okay. I'm, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing you. I'm, I'm, <laughs> but, right, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that like, uh, like I do bad things to some degree, and some people do things that are way more bad than me, and those people freak me out. But I, in order for us to have an appropriate response to them uh, it, it, that, I, that go by my values, the, the way I want the world to be, then I think that we shouldn't just say they're completely separate from me. I'm good and they're evil. Um, right. Like we have to be able to see ourselves as evil for us to be able to see them as evil and be okay with it. Mm. Okay, I would say people who engage in war are closer to evil than good, but they could have a good reason for engaging what they perceive it, perceive as as an action leading to what I would call evil. So I would say I'm more lenient on people with ideology who do bad closer to evil than people who have no ideology and no values and are not even doing it for what I would call a good reason, though those people are even more interestingly scary because I'm like, wait, wait, you didn't even have an ideology telling you to do it? You just did it? That seems even more unhinged in a way right so even you brought up i was up gonna ask you about mm -hmm. that a little yeah. bit ago actually because I, I you said something about like introspecting versus evil and i was gonna ask you if you believe in like morally lucky people and what you what you think about them what would that be what is a morally lucky person Morally lucky person is somebody who's kind of raised with all the right, uh, yeah. like knowing what all the right outcomes are supposed to be. They know what they're supposed to do. They know what not to do. And they're very print, like they are very good at doing these things, but they can't tell you why they couldn't like, they couldn't explain it to you. They don't necessarily have the tools to like dig into it. And that's pro I think, I think I know where you're coming. I know where you're coming people. from. I know where Tom's coming from. This is the Calvin and Hobbes question. <laughs> That's why okay. I was laughing. I don't Calvin and yeah. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say Calvin in one up in one thing is uh contemplating like, all right, so as I I'm a kid who's like more inclined to do naughty things, which would make me lose presence. 
So if I do something that's good, does that make it more good than somebody who is naturally inclined to do good things all the time? Like as a goody two shoes, does he get like the same amount of presence that I get for doing a good act as a bad kid compared to him who's a naturally good kid who just naturally wants to do virtuous things? Um, so I guess it's just like, if you're naturally inclined to be virtuous, are you, does that count for more? Um, or does it count for less because it just comes easier for you? I think, is that kind of what you're getting at? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah. Is that like, a, so it was because she was talking about introspection. And I think that you have to understand like what it is that is making things good or bad in order to introspect on what it is that you're doing and what you want to do in the future and how you w would want to change your behavior. But if you don't actually like contemplate what makes things right and wrong, you just happen to have been raised as to where you have a pattern of behavior. You just do these things, but you're not actually considering the aspects that make them right or wrong, which again, I think is probably most people. I don't think people like us are sitting around having philosophical conversations and just brainstorming with a ton of people. I think that they're they They don't have go sit around with their friends and drink wine and talk about Hobbes and Locke and all of these other people. They, they, like they probably don't consider most of these things uh, most of the time. Well, my, my instinct is to say that it's a part of both of you, I guess, like sleeves, like inherent saying kids have inherent, like maybe empathy or some on spectrum have some goodness within them. So they naturally have an inclination. And then Tom's being raised in the bubble that gives them the closest to making peace. Cause most people are mm -hmm. relatively good. Like most people are not violent. Like we're doing pretty good as, as a species, right? Like it's pretty safe for most people around most parts of the world, quotation marks. So we're doing pretty good, like in general. So I would say it's probably those things. I think some people get lucky in a sense because they're given more tools to be introspective faster or in in a more efficient manner than somebody else. But then the irony is like, if you're born into a rough enough situation, it might force you into introspection faster than the privileged kid. So the irony is like, it's just really up to the individual consciousness and their relationship to the information around them and how they process it. So some people are just, I think it's a mixture of like biology, nature versus nurture. It's like a little bit of a mix of both of those, I think. So I, I did that answer your question, Tom? I think so, yeah. Okay. I, I think it's just, uh, it's just like a baffling concept because when I try to picture this person, they feel like uh, like they they failed to individuate as a person somehow, and like their existence seems immoral to me. Like they are latched onto someone else who actually has opinions, and they just believe whatever the other person tells them at all times. I mean, I think it's more so that they like they know what will make it to where people won't engage with them. Like, this is why I say that like the stigmas are, are important. The red flags are all that matter in the end is because lots of people can't tell you why they're not going to misgender a trans person anymore. They can't explain gender. They can't talk about, uh, you know, gender dysphoria. They don't understand. They're just the afraid of here. getting they're lashed out at, at Yes, they just know that it's bad, that Twitter will come after them, that they'll be labeled a, a transphobe, which is why we use these labels of like racist, transphobe, mm. homophobe, all of these things is because we know these are bad labels. They're stigmatized labels. We put it on you. Now you're doing the bad thing. You're the bad person. You don't want to be the freaking bad person. So you avoid the behavior that might get you labeled in that way. But I think that's a lack of introspection on society's part. It's a, it's not it actually just, moving society yeah. in a more introspective way way right because you're you're forcing well, people we to can't pretend. have those expectations of people though that's the point is that we most people will not do these things they will most because, people will never do these things because we literally don't encourage it like we have an anti-introspective yeah. like narrative in the world because we want to simplify everything which is fine so it's natural but part of our progression is this like if you think you're one of the people that introspect then we are the ones who can pass that along if we want you don't have to of course but like if you are going to pass it along and i have that faith in humanity i think humanity is going in a more introspective perspective way all the time because we're given more tools and opportunities to do it. But I also think people of the past were very introspective just in their own way with their own tools. So I would say it's more like the curiosity factor. How many humans are curious enough to be introspective? And if they're if they're lacking curiosity, that makes sense to me that they would be less introspective, right? And they would just go with the flow. But I don't want a society personally that is bullied into being good. I want a society that actually understands why we're doing what we're doing, which is why when you have children, you need to explain to them why it's bad to murder. Not just that they shouldn't, well, but why it's bad to murder. 
not just that, like it, curiosity is one thing, but critical thinking is something totally different. And I think that like actually teaching these things in school and actually adding a lot more like philosophy courses for yeah. kids is probably a, a big difference maker. Yeah. But most critical people, thinking, like I said, they don't even have the tools in the first place. But you know, it's a buzzword, that, right? That everyone thinks they're a critical thinker. Like everyone thinks they're a critical thinker, which is the mistake. Why do we all think we're good at thinking? Actually, that's an interesting proposition is if you're Arena more introspective, after. are you less evil? Yeah, you know, yeah, like I think the, so. See, I think the, the more introspective, yeah, the less evil you are. Now, hold on, Arena, yeah. go. I know you've been trying to talk for a while. Keep yourself unmuted yeah. if you can, girl, so we know. Okay. Uh, there would be a lot of background noise oh, if true, I did true. that. Okay, no problem. Um, oh, what was I going to – okay, a few I things. I don't hear any background noise from you yeah, you're at all. Oh, okay, that's good. Um. So, Brittany, you talked about the evil or the bad in cat and dog societies. I would love an example of what that looks like um, because, because are we – or like, yeah, what standards would dogs have versus cats have for their societies, right? Because those are relatively – well, dogs are more so social animals than cats, but cats live in colonies, so they're somewhat <clears throat> social. Um, what do you think – and then – Another part, and this is to everybody, if we accept Smith's premise that, or not not that, but if we assume there's a proportion of people that are evil and then a proportion of people that are good, what is that proportion? And how comparable is that proportion to other social and not social species? Is, is it the same proportion? Is it different from mammals to reptiles to birds? Do, do the proportions change? Does it uh, go from genus? Do we start looking at the genus? <laughs> and then there is where the proportions are similar. And then um, also plants, because there are plants where they survive by sucking out the nourishment from mm -hmm. surrounding trees and from other plants. Mm -hmm. Or there are um plants that survive more symbiotically and they you know use these fungal they, like, cackle when they do it <laughs> <laughs> but what is a good plant what is a bad yeah. plant as an yeah. individual plant versus plants yeah. as a whole or like okay. a particular species of plant. so to answer the first part of your question and this is obviously like my lens is like in even in animal kingdoms so i'll take the lion king as an example i just feel like the closer to peace you are and the further away from evil you are the closer to joy you are so when you have animals that can like cohabitate live together like i watched two dogs the other day argue at each other and their parents or people let them like talk longer and the dogs just kind of chilled after a while i was like huh, look at that they went from like angry to like chilling together and they figured it out and i think dogs Dogs and animals who can socialize better together and with other different animals, they're closer to like then being more animal, 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 which exhibits evil behavior. But again, evil is like, what does that even mean, right? It's the furthest away from joy. So I'm not even moralizing evil. I'm actually trying to stay away from moralizing evil. And I'm trying to say that we moralize too much. And then uh, what did you just say? I think that's it from my end. Maybe. Oh, uh, like the Lion King, though, I do think life is a circle of life and death. And I do think we're meant to consume one another, whether that's culturally or by adaptability, whether that's like changing culture and saying like, we're going to we're going to progress this way. But instead of like leaving people behind in destruction, I think there's a way to like almost like with dignity, like move people into the next era, including animals that like eat each other. There's more like dignity in some parts of nature than others. If you watch a lot of animal documentaries, I feel like sometimes I'm like, oh, there's the dignity in that animal death. And here's like a lack of dignity. Like, because when they're when they're starving and they're rabid and they're just like, they're crazy, the animals, it's a much less dignified kill. But when the animal is like healthy, the animal is like kills like with mercy. It's like really interesting. So anyways, that's my anecdote. I get it. I, I, I'm not understanding. What do you mean? Me? What does it mean to, yes, you, what does it mean to, uh, like assess evil outside of a moral lens? Like, if we're talking about morality, generally, we're talking about rules that we place on interactions between humans. So, what is evil if not just the way that we grade those interactions? Um, do you moralize joy? No, I, I don't moralize everything, but joy isn't necess joy isn't a way that I grade those interactions, whereas evil is. Okay, so for me, evil is that relationship we're having up against another thing or within ourselves, so still up against another thing that causes great destruction and opposite of joy. 
So anything that leads you furthest from joy is closest to evil. And instead of moralizing a natural species that tends to play with both of these two coins and like this very like strong, you know, opposites, we go on this journey of ping ponging between the two and getting closer or farther away from one or the other. And instead of I don't moralize joy now and I moralize evil, except through my lens of morals. And so I'm looking for big T objective truth. And since I don't think we have access to it exactly, and I think we're evolved animals on a planet and we're just like atoms crashing up against each other, I have to ultimately argue that evil is the opposite of joy, but it's neither moral or immoral to engage outside of the construct we've created, which comes from our desire to hold a society in which we feel safe. So I think everything is a construct, like everything is our own making. And so therefore, like, I don't have to moralize evil in that sense. If we're talking like true philosophy, big picture, like. But I think we all think that it's, I think all of us here think it's constructed. That doesn't change whether or not we think evil is some way of grading the interactions that we're having with other people. Um, I, I think on like a, a macro, like I am looking at it in that way and I can't moralize it. I could only go down to the micro, which is like our individual lives and our societies, and then I can moralize it. But I can't moralize it. So what does it that mean? That's my point. Is it, it like it? I feel like just based on definition, mm -hmm. it is inherently moral. Like definitionally, we are talking about morality no matter what. And I feel like maybe you're saying like remove emotions from the way mm. you're thinking about it or something More like uh i don't moralize a tornado hitting a town and killing a thousand people because the tornado is part of nature and i think we're a part of nature so when we do things it is our nature so when we are evil mm. we are acting within our nature of dealing with temptation mm. dealing with our own sure. like consciousness so i'm trying to say that in order to radically accept it i must also accept that i am capable of this nature because it is within me going back to what smith was saying so we all have this ability and then I can say down to the micro Britney's perceived values would say, okay, this is what I would call evil and I could moralize it in that context. So I'm saying both are true at the same time. Okay. I, I'm not understanding. It sounds like you're saying I want to look at, at, at five outside of a numero, uh, like a, a numero, a numerological, numero, yeah. numerological. I don't want to. Yes. Numerological lens. Uh, so what, maybe like, another way just, to say it is like, yeah the the actions that we call evil so like evil is actually a construct right like we're labeling certain actions as evil so those actions we we don't have to moralize them as evil in order to say that they're bad if that makes sense sure. but once we call them evil we are moralizing we are moralizing and it. so she's yeah. saying so britney's language is just evil. limited but i think she's under, you know, okay, I think, so you're saying least, the yeah. actions that we would call evil, but we're not going to moralize it. Is I, that I would say like, OK, in a very like, again, maybe I'm being too metaphysical or spiritual here, but like if we are in nature, like a tornado is nature, then you can't moralize us, but you can only moralize us through our perception. So it's only when we recognize we even exist in the first place and we can cause harm, then we can sure. moralize it. My question is, are we talking about the actions or the concept of evil? Because you said, I want to look at evil without moralizing it. And I'm asking, are you looking at actions we would call evil and just not moralize the actions? Or are you saying the concept of evilness? I don't want to moralize that. I, I think I'm open to a discussion. So I'm not I'm trying to say, like, for me, in order okay. to radically actually understand that on the micro things could be evil, I have to first accept that they aren't moralized naturally they're only moralized through our perception and then we can have a discussion about what is evil on the micro but i think for especially like as i hope to have these panels i'm hope to in i hope to introduce this idea that like we're always just thinking like this and i want us to consider this in order to like optimize this okay well so i think i agree with uh what was a maiden Har monster harmony yeah maiden monster harmony yeah harmony is like yes if you're talking about the actions and of them themselves things that we would call evil but just talking about the actions that that makes total sense but if yeah. we're talking about talking about the concept of evil outside of a moral lens i just i i think like definitely definitionally we it's like impossible I, and, uh, uh, I just wanted to specify. I don't. I do think I think about this slightly different than everybody else on the panel. Um, me too. You know, you said, I think that most people think about this like non-inherently. I do believe that it is like pretty inherent. But one of Brittany's questions was, "Do you think that you, when we're talking about me, we're talking about all humans or just yourself?" 
And I do think that like my viewpoint on empathy and how we view empathy towards each other might have been a little overinflated. I used to think personally, yeah, a lot of people probably see the things that I do, or if you punch someone, you understand that harm even as a child. But it sounds like on this panel, a lot of people disagree with me on that one. So that's where I have to differentiate like how I would perceive this type of thing. Um, I don't see it as uh, separate from an uh, uh, inherent empathetic response. So, you know, it's been interesting to hear other people's viewpoints on that. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I will connect it to a, an empathetic response, but not, a, I don't think the empathetic response is inherent, but still empathetic response. Um, I, I don't see, uh, morality as something that for me can apply to something like the Lion King, because for me, the question of morality all uh, comes down to, there's only two answers that are, that are, that are possible for me uh, that I'm okay with. And that that's, are humans evil or are humans good? And uh, I, 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 I'm not comfortable saying some humans are evil and some, some humans are good. Um, and uh, so, so for me to like cross species, like, um, like some plants are like uh, leeching the life off of other plants and stuff. Um, like, I mean, f for every species, either all of the all of the members of that species are evil or all of them are good like from like it's probably good um like the only reason to to think that all of your species is evil is to be self-critical and if you don't have that only humans have that capacity so it really doesn't mean anything for anything but a human well octopi yeah. and whales might have that capacity we don't know there's other animals that may have maybe that whales I'll, I'll fight you on the <laughs> octopi one but yeah <laughs> Yeah, whales. Haven't are you seen my octopus teacher man? Aren't one. social animals. <laughs> so, yeah, they're like. Have you guys ever seen documentaries on ants in termites? Mm -hmm. It's like it's uh, amazing to watch these things and think somehow they are not individuals mm -hmm. whatsoever. Like in any way whatsoever, they are not individuals. They are all just part of this greater thing at all times. It, they like literally will just go and sacrifice themselves and kill themselves, not out of any selfish reasoning like we were talking about before, where like, you know, you want to feel that joy, you want to feel elated, you want to feel righteous in giving your life up for your kids or your, you know, your wife or something. It's just it's just told to do it and it just goes and does it. And that's the end of it. And I think that as humans, we're trying to like uh, get away from the individual as much as possible and take more and more people into consideration and get people to act as though they are part of a colony. They are part of a society. They do need to take others into consideration consistently in the way that they act. And we're just evolving more and more into, um, into being less of an individual. Hmm, that's interesting because in this week's podcast, I don't know if you watched it, I mentioned ants and I said, do we look at them as individuals or not? That's interesting you brought that up. Oh, yeah, no. But they ants are definitely not. not individuals. In death, they, they become an individual because ants right. bury their dead. And they kick Just them out like of the nest. Club. They like ostracize them. It's interesting. I do consider them to be an individual consciousness. <laughs> Every ant. <laughs> yeah, you said plants are conscious. I, and yeah. that, that, uh, that immediately, I'm like, oh, God. They've been doing research on it. They say, like, there's real research. There's books written on it. It's really interesting. And again, like. Yeah, but when you do that, you're defining consciousness different from the way I define consciousness. Sure. Well, so the consciousness that we're talking That's a different about order is the fact that of they can see things so, or they can understand things outside of themselves. So earlier you were talking about plants leeching off one of another, but it actually turns out they communicate with one another and give each other nutrients to work as a, like an overall organism to help each other. Even they have studies where they're like killing one plant and as soon as they start killing one they start getting a bunch of uh like signals from all of the other plants and if they're not connected in any way they don't have roots touching each other nothing like that but all of a sudden you start chopping up a plant close to a tree and all of the trees start sending off a ton of signals out of nowhere and so it seems like they are communicating a ton of information with one another and somehow have a type of consciousness that we're just not even capable of understanding yet Smith doesn't like that. Which is why we need to stop destroying everything so we can all work together to research it. He's mad because he's vegan and he doesn't eat animals. Are you really vegan? I was going to say that absolutely not. Existence Absolutely inherently not evil. 
Who so existence is, is inherently oh, evil that. because it requires. Like, I can't eat anything. This is bull crap. <laughs> okay, answer that yeah. because um, I always say on your channel, Tom, I'm always like, nobody should have kids. And your audience is always like, Brittany, you can't think this. I don't actually literally think no one should have kids. I think it's in our nature. It's like asking the sun not to come out tomorrow. It's like, what? But I wonder, is it inherently evil to procreate ultimately by forcing people into existence in this thing we called life? No, I think that like we we want to exist. I think all of us are happy that we exist. I, I'm generally for the kind of pro-life for the most part, where I think that like it, it, once this thing has been created and has its own DNA, like it is something that should have some right to exist in some mm. sense. And the uh, it, it, like all of us have inherent drives to continue existing for some reason. And so I think that, yeah, like most of us are happy that for some reason, the egg and the sperm that got chosen happened to be whatever created us and our consciousness. And now we get to be here and we get to experience this while by far the majority of eggs and the majority of sperms don't get those chances. And so, yeah, I think like it's a, I, I think that it's a, a privilege to exist. And I think most people see it that yeah, way. You're the victor. I think the meaning of life mm -hmm. psychologically is a three letter word. And, uh, and I think that if you're a human, then, and you deprive yourself, uh, like you, ha you, if you, you have to hate yourself in order to, in order to not like, and I mean, it's okay to do, to, to not want kids and everything. And I don't want kids right now. And I don't, I don't know if I'm ever going to be in a place where I do want them, but I, I don't think that it's evil to have them because it's like just part of being a human. And, you know, eat, like, it's like eating meat. Like, I, that's why I'm not a vegan. Like, I, I eat meat because I'm a human and it's, it causes harm to other animals. But I'm a human. I, I, I like there are like there are some things I'm willing to do to limit the, the, my human things. But something like sex and eating meat and like like those are things that I, you just can't take away from me. Mm, but everything we do. Yeah, have you have you having children as a celebration of the goodness of life? Yeah, mm, that's beautiful. OK, but Smith, literally like, everything we do is human. Everything we do is human. Yeah, but like that's why I said the meaning of life psychologically is a three letter word like that's sex. And like, I, so I, I think that it's so core to being human, like cl trimming my fingernails. Like if, if, if we really decided like that's like the worst, like that's one of the worst things that we do for some reason, um, I could give that up, whatever. OK, like but like that, that's that that's that's different. That's not a big deal. It's not something that's so core to being a human. Are you talking to me about the meaning of human life or life period? Because I would, there's plenty human. of organisms. That, okay, human. Okay. Human life, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, just the way we think. Like, like the reason that we, like, have hierarchies and the reason that we are, like, so competitive and everything is because we want to reproduce and then re make more babies and then those will make more babies. And, like, that's way it all, that's way it all crumbles. And My biology professor once said, like, to take it even more on the micro than that is... Ultimately, the purpose of life is to reproduce proteins. DNA <laughs> makes proteins. Viruses, there's like this argument, are viruses alive? All they do is infect a cell, and they have to reproduce by infecting a cell. And they're just making proteins. That's life. You make proteins, and you make more proteins by making a baby. And proteins apparently want to exist. <laughs> yeah, it's like nature protein. Yeah. It's like crystals, like they, they just create more crystals and it's like, what's the point? But like, if it didn't do it, then there wouldn't be crystals. So there is like, that, that has to be the point. Now, I'm curious, did anyone come into this discussion with like a hope that we would discuss a certain thing in mind? Did anyone like have an idea of what they were going to get out of it or what they wanted to explore in it? I had no idea. I was hoping to get the W. <laughs> you did. You did. You always do. Because I know for me, if there's nobody who I know for me, like the point of this is hope I'm hoping to have discussions that will give us like better tools of understanding. And I think it's difficult because we're like a group of like pretty good people and we're not looking to destroy one another. And we'd all probably work pretty good in a society together. But if we brought someone else into this mix who was like, you ought to do X or this is the way it has to be or like it is your obligation. Like when Smith says it's our biological like drive to have kids, I don't hear on if you don't have kids, you're a bad person. But for somebody else, they would say, because it is our biological drive, it is your obligation now. And now you have to do it or you're bad. And so there is something to be said about the 
group that I've brought together. It's like this little bubble of like nice people who like tend to share ideas. But how do we go from being these people to people that then start calling people evil and then start discriminating against people and then start putting people in jail and then start killing each other? And then how does it go from this to everything else we see and how are we contributing to that perception that leads to that evil? Oh, so I think that that's where our levels of development come into play, like our nervous system and our attachment styles. So like if your nervous system is constantly getting dysregulated, um, you literally, the, like if you um, look at polyvagal theory, um, you stop being able to socialize, like your ability to understand language goes down. You don't see faces as safe. You see them as dangerous. Um, so that's one thing for not meeting our, our um, animal needs for our nervous system. Um, attachment theory for the, on the mammal level comes into play. Uh, if you have um, bad parents, you know, you have anxious or avoidant attachments or disinterested, you know, there's um, attachments that will affect you later in life when it comes to like being in relationships. And then you think of like domestic violence and like the violence that happens because of yeah, misunderstandings because of attachment. And then you go to the monkey level, social things come into play, um, and you don't meet those needs on those levels, then they become maladaptive. Um, and that's, I think, where you get people who are hyper-individualistic, but to like a, uh, like a narrowing degree, maybe not like a, a degree that affords them, like gives them affordances. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, so I think that like it just comes to like uh, taking care of your different adaptive needs on each of your level, uh, each of your levels of existence as a person, a human. I think that we ha it's part of human evolution to get to the point where we have to have rules on in our interactions. We have to create uh, rules on how we know most humans want to be treated and how most people want. Uh, us to engage with them and so we have to like build more and more constructs and evolve more and more to get to the point where we're trying to create as many people uh, or where we're able to make a place where as many people can be as happy as possible and uh, can strive as much as possible and sometimes that means yeah like putting people in jail locking them up uh, stigmatizing the few who are doing the bad things and over time those things become less and less common a uh, hundred years ago it was super common for everybody to be racist but we came up with terms like racist and started using those to label people and stigmatize people and stigmatize actions so that those kids who grew up during those times knew not to do those things they raised their kids not to do those things they raised their kids not to do those things and we just kind of uh what do you call it, like social and socially engineered that sort of behavior out of society more and more to where we get to better places more and more. I think that the way that we uh, we can infect people with our thoughtfulness so that they are not people that will label other people as evil, which I think is the effect of what Tom is saying. I think you're going to make people dumber with that attitude. Like if you want to herd people like cattle, you're going to have a society of cattle. And I think if you want we to want have a, a of I don't want that. And I think that if you want to infect people with with thoughtfulness, then you have to what you have to do is bravery and you have to be brave and you have to stand up to uh, like to like mob mentality. You have to stand up to the crowd. Um, you have to you have to be willing to say things that are going to like like piss people off and get you ostracized. And then go to war with the north. And then, um, and then roll in the money from all the haters. I don't know if you got that one. I'm saying like in the end, so when we're trying to get rid of slavery now, okay, well, we're not going to deal with your mob mentality trying to get rid of slavery. We're, we're going to war with you guys. We want our state's rights. Um, <laughs> slavery? Like... <laughs> Yeah, the, like slavery wasn't ended because we stigmatized uh, racism. Right. And racism the, didn't end the, because we called the, it racism. Slavery at the point when we went to war was very unpopular in large parts of the country. 
and still fairly popular in other parts of the country. There's reasons for that. This is like ingrained in them from early ages. It's part of their cultural norms. It's like things that they grew up with their entire lives that they knew nothing other than. And then all of a sudden people are trying to take that away from them. It's part of their values. It's uh, as individuals, they, they've decided that this is okay. And other individuals decided that it's not okay. But some group of individuals was trying to think of more people than just themselves they were trying to think of more people than just the white people and trying to think of a better society than just that and uh and so yes like part of the stigma there were times when across the entire world slavery was perfectly fine and nobody thought anything of it the only reason that those ideas were ever stigmatized and ever went away is because people were fighting against it coming up with better ideas and stigmatizing the bad ones we know. I think it's because we made made it illegal, and then we still were very racist, and we still dis uh, like did, still Why discriminated. Why did we make it illegal, Smith? We made it. I mean, I don't know because uh, <laughs> because people, for one, some people didn't like it, and also for economic reasons, and it was convenient, and there was disagreement, and the people that won were the people that didn't want slavery. But that yeah. the, the, they we didn't we didn't make the people that wanted slavery stop wanting slavery by stigmatizing it. We made it by by like right. literally changing the law. And uh, right. and I and I don't think it, it actually right. stopped them from being racist or anything. We just like literally physically like stopped them from from doing anything. Yeah, there are so, people even nowadays who say that you know slavery and the war on slavery was like an economic thing. It wasn't like because we all inherently realized that slavery was bad. It's to an extent. It's both. It's not one or the other. Like it went away at a much faster rate because of the laws. But even today, we can say see very fast change with transphobia and homophobia. And it's not because we made it illegal. It's because we actually are seeing social change based on stigmatization of bad ideas and of harmful ideas. But we're not. What we're seeing is like people are gonna. The pendulum is gonna swing back and Backlash. forth. Like. What we're going to see is sure. people pretending to pro be bro or tolerant of LGBT and trans people, but given the opportunity, mm. they will swing things back in another direction because they didn't actually change. Like for yeah. me, a society is useless unless it changes or transforms. Otherwise, we're all just like doing the same thing we're doing to other people. We're forcing people to live in a hellhole of their own like social situation. And I don't want to do that to other people either, even if they are rooted, like at their root doing things to, that I think are discriminatory. To an extent, you're right. But- those kids, again, who are growing up now yeah. are growing up in a society where it is uh, uh, like they can't do these things out in the open. Right. And they are growing up in a society where they are just it's just ingrained in them early on. They are socialized very differently than their parents were. Sure. And so now they're growing up and they're, they'll raise their kids with it being even more stigmatized and even more of a bad thing. And it will just become less and less over time. And this is how we've seen social change take over ev ev for tons of different things. But Morals this is a bubble all... phenomenon here. This is an absolute mm -hmm. bubble phenomenon because where you're saying that there's social stigma that would prevent people from acting like this, I would argue that there's also social stigma, depending on where you are, to act the opposite. You know, if you are LGBT, then your parents might and your society might come out harshly <laughs> against that and look at mm -hmm. that as a maladaptive behavior. So I don't that think it's just like a one way push. It's absolutely like a fragmented idea that like has two very real sides to it. I agree. But that was the norm. Uh you know, 20, 30 years ago, and is becoming less and less the norm today. We are seeing uh, it move in one direction. It's that while they're like generally harsh pushback. So say, instead of just saying like, hey, you shouldn't, uh, you know, um, you shouldn't misgender somebody or you should use their preferred pronouns or blah, blah, blah. Instead of saying that, we say they're going to kill themselves. You're and you're going to be a murderer. And then you're like, you're going to be the one to blame. Like, yes, we're going to see a massive pushback to this. But if instead, yes, we're just kind of saying, hey, yeah, like you should you should try to pr use their preferred pronouns. That's not nice. That's mean. Like, you know, this is harmful. You could hurt people like this. That's like a much better way of dealing with it. And so we see the extreme people on the internet who are like going as hard as they can accusing people of like all sorts of things and just being very uh, vindictive in the way that they engage uh, and yeah we're always going to see a, a pushback to that but that's the, there is like a, a good process to get social change and to move in a single direction yeah I think i'm going to hold on I, mm -hmm. there there's a history what you're talking about is basically populism 
And for the entire history of populism, um, ever since the first time it, it reared its ugly head, the French Revolution, it has always achieved extremely dramatically um, a, a opposite effects to what it actually sets out to do. It always causes oh. massive harm in the wrong direction. What does this have to do with populism? Your, your, what you're saying is we should have a social movement that that is uh, like a extra like like thing um, on to democracy where we socially all decide to change society and everything. And that always like that. The only times that that ever actually changes anything is with like gay rights and stuff when it's actually not like it, it's actually financially beneficial to to be to to like give equal rights and shit, st stuff like like rights to women that, that. But if but if there's ever in any like, yes. So if it's actually like financially like an incentive to do it, then it then mm -hmm. yeah, we'll go in that direction because of that. That's not it's not because of the social engineering. It's because of well, the financial no, that's, incentive. Why, that's how it becomes wait that that is how it becomes financially uh no beneficial. no 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 yes. so in, so in another example when it becomes financially not not like lucrative um and and so so uh, like in ton, to tons of things like if you want to make society a better place for people you're gonna have to make sacrifices and in any one of those instances it never happens ever you're not going to yeah, see the society become forward. vegan. Not You're not going to see society become vegan because of this. You're not going to see everybody start like 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 uh you not using fossil fuels or whatever. Like th th this just doesn't work. Yeah. If you want to make people stop using fossil fuels, you have to make a law, but you can't just shame people into doing it because it's it's it's, it's it, there's an incentive to use them and that's what's going to happen. The only time that'll ever work is with gay rights or something very small that hurts nobody. Mm. Okay, ultimately, this kind of does coincide and connect to the subject at hand, right? Like good and evil and like, what does this even mean? And I think this is my fear. And this is why I on my channel focus on like bubble rhetoric, because again, like we I'm okay with saying politically, we're going to make more people accessible through the law to like live the life they want. And then we can work on moving society actually in a direction of change through introspection to make it clear to them like everything we're doing is a construct which means we don't have the answers but the dilemma is so many people are still focused on having the answer we know what's good for society we know what's right for the world and it's usually rooted in some sort of belief that they were raised with or had access to or sort of converted into and so the dilemma again is like i'm not upset that you have a belief that's strongly connected to like a god until that god interferes with the legal rights of like other people you don't like but i don't want to make them feel like they are also suffocated in the world and they feel ostracized or targeted i want to say like either we have to learn to live together where we're not targeting each other right but in order to do that we also have to dispel this idea that any of us are evil or that all of us have evil accessible to us because again remember like from my conservative bubble the reason lgbt people are scary is because they're pedophiles or they're a, a sexual assaulters or they're like groomers, evil yeah. they're groomers they're evil so until you even get you have to get rid of the narrative of evil or or have a real relationship with the the reality that we are all evil or something in order to even talk about moving society in a direction of understanding otherwise because that's that yeah, I was just gonna that's exactly what I was thinking too, is just like there is another bubble whereas you can say like it's evil to discriminate against people, they would say it's evil to encroach on their children with your ideology. Right. Um and so there isn't just like a straight societal snapback, just like we all understand that that's bad now and there's a pressure towards it because that pressure also leads towards this other pressure where people feel like their families are being encroached it's not on linear. their ideas like, and their religion. All yeah. of this activism we're doing is great, but it's not linear. History shows that it's gonna repeat and it's gonna cycle through and like our kids will be more conservative down the line and we might even bring racism back because like there's a lot of bias in the world and it might look different but it's going to be you know what i mean still racism it's not like it's gone now <laughs> like it's still here it just doesn't look like slavery in the way that we grew up thinking about it so again it's just like if we want people to be more introspective and compassionate meaning to suffer with we must first realize we can suffer and empathize with other people or even logically empathize in a way like to actually just do the math of like oh i could have been you i could have literally been born into your family with your skin color with your body type hold on wait what does that actually mean right because some people with their religious beliefs do believe like they are the chosen people and to think like you are chosen already puts you away from other people or i am not the monster you are the monster so again when i think of evil i think of it as furthest away from joy and joy looks like harmony not you harmony though close but like <laughs> harmony with other people with other energies of the world animals people things 
Yeah, uh, I'm just to bounce on the thought really quickly. Um, I'm trying to give some space here because I know I was talking a lot really early in this uh, panel. Talk. But um, I, I truly think that that is like one element where I would even disagree because like if I'm thinking about like LGBT issues, like you're encroaching on my family. I'm like, well, you know what? Like you don't have to run your family like that, but you can't tell somebody else not to live their life because that makes your family uncomfortable would be generally like my response to that. And I would have a very similar reaction to racism and things like that. So I think that actually like in an ideal world, I would probably more agree with Tom. I would think that that kind of pressure would naturally lead people towards what I think would be a good outcome. However, I don't think like everybody. I know I don't think like everybody. And the realness of that feeling that these things are encroaching on your family is just as real a narrative and is just as a big of a societal push for individuals to go one way or another. Um, so it's really not just like as linear as he believes. I believe it ebbs and flows kind of like what Brittany's talking about here. Well, it's, I, I obviously agree. There, there's not just one kind of stigma, right? So she's just talking about the stigma on the opposite end. She's just talking about the labels and red flags that are used on the opposite end to stigmatize, to stigmatize the opposite thing. Um, there's a reason that initially you're trying to destigmatize trans people and then stigmatize the discrimination of them because another group before them this uh, stigmatized that group and made them a red flag in the first place. And so, but you use like, the example the of labels tactic used. Yes, Usually, I'm saying the, yeah, same the example labels, of labels, like calling flag, someone yes. transphobe is going to push society in the right direction. That's what I mean by but I would flag, argue that saying labels. calling people like groomers isn't pushing society in the right direction. This warfare can go both ways. Oh, I'm and not just saying it's necessarily pushing things in the right direction. I'm saying that this oh, okay. is how we move society one way or the other. I'm not saying that it always moves in the right direction. Obviously, it's that's. OK, We've what I was very hearing bad is that directions this is many a, times right, that this is good and that it's pushing society in a good direction when we use these tools like, you know, labeling people because it helps them act correctly. Wait, is that yeah, what no, you, I mean, you can. Isn't that what no, you were I was, saying, Tom? I was saying yeah, that's, that what that's I heard. how we've done. I'm saying that that's how we did it with the trans labels. But that's uh, that's how both sides do it. Obviously, the like Jewish people in Nazi Germany were grown to be hated through the same exact process. And this is just how social norms are built over time, whether it's good ones or bad ones. Fear through fear. Yeah. Mm. Which is the root of all evil. Yeah, through your own self-interest is like the point. Is that like you yourself don't want to be stigmatized. You don't want to be labeled. You want to be able to engage with everybody else. And so you uh, abide by these rules. The reason we got into that argument is because initially Smith was saying that you have to fight back against mob rule. My point is that one way or the other, you are always uh, abiding by mob rule. It's You're just picking which mob. Sure. There just, too many, just too many to fight. You could you could fight them all, but you'd die. You know, you'd, you'd just be asunder. You'd, you'd, everybody'd hate you. Yeah, okay, I totally misunderstood. I thought that you were talking about the enforcement mechanisms of good and how you actually, like, you know, push things in the right direction rather than things get pushed in directions, which obviously I would agree with. Yeah, sorry. I was just using like a specific thing as a as an example to say like this is how we've done good in the past, but this is also how we do bad. With this is just how we create social norms overall. Okay, and I like uh, Brittany. I also like Brittany calling us all like basically good people, and we're having like a good compass right here. It would be interesting to throw a truly evil personality into this uh, panel. <laughs> who would it be, I just though? I can't I can't imagine who it could be. Ooh. I could maybe play that character up a little bit, but um. I don't know. I can, like, uh, can I can call. Do you guys know who uh, Andrew Wilson is? No, do not yeah. call this man oh, into my yeah, space. That's a perfect <laughs> example. Do not call him into my Jen's space. best friend. That's a perfect no. good one. No. <laughs> no, see, okay, I, I will tell you. I blocked Andrew because he's so, he slid into my DMs with the most, like, outrageous, like, I was like, block. He's so, like, uh, but he's a person. And I have to radically accept that he's a person. He is he, smart. He really has, like, an idea and an ideology and a belief. And he thinks that people ought, ought, ought to be away and i'm like okay but he's so like i can't tell if he's even taking a second to even contemplate his own thoughts for five seconds outside of his own bubble but it sounds like he hasn't and so when he makes prescriptions he makes them with such violence in his voice that i'm like you are unsafe sir like you're too violent and it doesn't make any sense because you're supposed to be close to christ so make it make sense jesus was a hippie make it make sense so well, i was going to describe I just someone Sorry, I was going to describe someone who could 
fit our description of an evil person to join this panel, and they would have inevitably been Andrew Wilson. Just because I yeah. think, like, even if we hadn't said his name, if I had just, like, started listing characteristics of, like, who this person could be, it's... It's because of all the things that Brittany said, but of course, I think the fact that we all came into this conversation, like willing to hear each other, willing to consider each other's ideas and really be open to someone else's experience is why we're able to have a good conversation. I, to be fair, right? I didn't know that was going to happen. That. Last time Smith and I were on a panel together, all we did we were, was insult each other it. the yeah, entire yeah, yeah, yeah. time. Yeah, but you know what? Smith's kind of growing on me a little bit. He's got some, he's got some things to say. I, I appreciate it. And I, I would yeah, back with that to Andrew to Wilson. Extent. I also have had him blocked since the very first Twitch stream I ever did, like a year and a half ago which was a panel that I was on with him. And as soon as it was done, I was like, immediately, block. See, what do, I do, what do we do with Andrew? Where do we put him? Because, like, he's obviously a dad, right? He's, like, a husband. He has, like, a family and a whole life and a job. Oh, God, like... I feel bad for his kids. No, stop I it. Really stop do. It. But what if in that bubble he is, like, the hero? He is everything they want in a dad and like that's right. the question is like hmm how does his Look, society and my society hang out yeah Look, his wife's name on. is it's like patriarchy is based or something on twitter you know like Seriously. she loves the idea smith go ahead you, like, well he so may you, be the hero in his kid's eyes i my eyes. feel as if he has enough children where there's probably one of them that feels very judged and very uncomfortable growing up in this non-accepting family. Probably. Probably. Go ahead, Smith. Okay, so you, you, the reason we, we came to Andrew Wilson is because um, you were talking, Brittany. You were you were you were saying like who would be the like the type of person that would be like the evil person. But I like you, the, the, you're saying the type of person that would be the evil person is the person that would like prescribe someone as being evil. So. I think that you have to be more like self, like uh, yeah, you have to like you know you you're being Andrew Wilson. Yeah, you're being him. You're doing that's it. Okay, you, you... but then yeah, my follow up question was gonna be like, but is he really that evil? Well, so that's what I was gonna he's say. Not, I, just, I, don't think I think we should let him out and defend himself. No, him. shut up. I don't, oh, <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> I don't think hilarious. we're all like Andrew and I have a lot of history to each other's ideas. I think that it's that we all. <laughs> come to these from very similar places most of us agree for by far the majority of the part even smith seems to be the outlier and he agrees with by far the majority of things that we're saying and so we're just talking about somebody who yes is just like who's gonna have a lot more disagreements with the types of uh things that we're saying but he can hop onto a panel with a bunch of other christian nationalists and feel perfectly at home and have mm -hmm. you know uh uh like uh you know nice rational and uh uh safe conversations there so therefore does Mara. evil even yeah. exist it, it, there, there, no i don't think there's an objective evil i don't think any of us believe in any objective evil no. so then ultimately when we make prescriptions we're just well, doing do. it so we feel more comfortable in the world well to some extent yes but we can make arguments for why some are better than others i like i overall don't just think that i just happened upon all of my beliefs i think i rationalized my way into these beliefs and i think that i was uh convinced into them like i like not too long ago i was andrew and i had very similar beliefs to him and i was very far right and it was arguing and debating people and being open-minded to what it was that people had to say that convinced me into the beliefs that i'm holding now and so i'm uh yeah it's more it's that like i do think that they're there, everybody believes in some sort of hierarchy uh, to their beliefs and that their beliefs are going to be at the top of those. But um, but yeah, I think that we can look at societies and, and tell that some are just creating better societies for more people. Is that the is that how you personally seem to like for me, I never think of like how to help the most people. I always think like how to help the individual that's trapped in a group of most people. <laughs> I think that the only reason that I value the individual is because I think that's part of helping the most people. Mm. We need Andrew Wilson's. 
the only reason that I care about like individual rights is because I think that's what's best for society. I think that we, we think of ourselves as individuals and we want to act on our own autonomy. And if we were just all like pushed into these communes where we had to act as, uh, you know, little cogs within a system, it would be detrimental to the individuals, create probably a lot more mental illness and a lot more suffering from it. And so I think, yes, like allowing individuals to be individuals is mm. part of what's beneficial to the overall society. Okay, I have two thoughts on that. I will say one, and if anyone is losing spoons or getting tired or needs to go, please do not feel, I know, I don't know what time it is where you guys are. It's like 3 a.m. where I am. So if anyone's feeling like they got to go, just like let us know, no problem. Um, but I will say two things to that. One, wait, fuck, why did I say that? And I lost my train of thought. <sighs> oh, when you say society, my brain is so aware of all the little micro bubbles in the world. And I call those societies and then I call bigger society societies and then I call like government societies. So when you say society, who do you mean? Do you mean state societies, city societies, town societies, or like world societies? Uh, so this one I'm talking about like the United States as a overall society okay so you want the united states as a society to all move in a specific direction yeah okay and obviously that affects other western societies as well western societies are affecting the rest of the world yeah, so, yeah. but when you say like i work for the individual and that's a good reflection of society you're not saying i want each individual and their consciousness to be happy with the way they think you want them to change so they're happy with how society thinks say that again because you want people to change right yeah so like when we when we talk about people doing something moral we're always going to grade the individual on whether or not they do they are doing a right or wrong thing and the only way that we can improve society is by improving each individual to create a better overall society for yeah. everybody else okay i agree but i'm curious about whether or not that's contingent on you transforming their way of thinking in regards to like lgbt people like again i want the religious people to live in society with the secular people but because they're individuals with this belief system but i need them to understand that their belief system is in a bubble and we're all in a bubble and we all need to figure out how to live together and i don't need you to change how you think i need you to change how you act but they can't do that because they can't vote outside their moral bubble so i need them to almost change who they are which is an attack on the individual to then mold into a society that i feel comfortable in therefore i'm not fighting for the individual i'm fighting for me as the individual against that individual yeah, but that's not like that's not possible. That's not pragmatic within a uh, democracy. Like we we will always have a bunch of different sides fighting for their beliefs to become the norm. And if you want your kids to grow up in a society where your values and your beliefs are the norm, you have to actually push for those changes. The norm that I grew up in is very, very different than the one that I'm fighting for for the future and for my kids to grow up in. And so I, because the norms have changed, what it was when my parents were kids is very, very different than what it is that I believe in now because it, society has changed and there are people who fought for those changes and made sure that I was growing up in a different world than them. How do you know it's not evil? I, I don't. But you're willing to take the chance. Well, I, I can make the arguments for why mine are better than others and why I think the outcomes are better. Okay. I can put I them side by another... side with a Muslim society, with Sharia law, or a Christian nationalist society, or any of these other societies, and I can like make arguments for why I think there are benefits to the one that I want versus theirs. Yeah. 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 Harmony, you want to say something? Well, I was going to say, I think another way like of viewing like those kinds of um, questions, like we're talking about like politics and governance and stuff like that is that like um, one way to look at it is that kind of acknowledging like as humans, we have biases. And so like we're coming to politics, you know, from a, a bias standpoint. And so one way to add value to the opponent <laughs> is that maybe the best field of correction for my own biases is through the lens, you know, of the biases of the other person and vice versa. Mm. And so in that sense, like it, it, it creates an opponent process, which mm. is different than adversarial processing, which is a parasitic process, but opponent process 
is where we kind of both need and afford each other by this kind of like dance that we're playing, you know, and we kind of exist. And, you know, the way that our, our systems work, especially in America, is we, we exist in the creative tension that we create, you know, by having all these different sides yeah. uh, in this opponent process kind of dance mm. that we play. Do you, do you think that there might be universal values amongst like all societies that we could identify that would be constant no matter where we're looking? And maybe those are values that we should strive for. That just reminded me of like something like the Ten Commandments or the Code of Hammurabi. Like since the ancient times, there were a few things that I think we like no stealing, Don't no kill. murdering, yeah. no, you know, beating people in the street unless yeah, unless that's, we yeah. Do yeah. The crime. that's the thing I'm thinking of right now is just like the idea like is murder like objectively wrong is that objectively evil because it seems as you've mentioned in the Hammurabi uh the 10 commandments there's so many like religious texts and all of them seem to identify that murder is bad however a lot of them also seem to identify things like female virginity is like you know good and it's something to aspire towards and we don't know if that's necessarily a virtue just because religion identified it to be such um, to, so, you know, killing is the like, Ten Commandments, one... they don't say anything about virginity, but they do say something about adultery. <laughs> yeah, well, adultery, as far as I understand, in religious times was kind of heavily associated with things like virginity mm -hmm. and saving yourself purity because there were less, I think, on average partners back then. Um, but the idea that like there is something that we've all identified across all cultures, this is just bad. Um, I don't I can't think of too many examples of that. The one that comes to mind for me is murder. Um, and I don't know if everybody would even agree with me on that if murder is universally bad, you know, killing senselessly. Um, I don't know. Maybe somebody here could justify that. You know, it's just a really bad day and maybe hey. I should be able to indulge in my, you know, my feelings. I don't know. No, no, no. So you, I, I don't agree with you. I think you're right. Like that, that all societies like have, have the, that uh, that principle of like murder is bad. But you know what? We all fucking love murder because like all societies, I don't, I don't, maybe there's one that I don't know. I'm not thinking of, but we all do it with the government. We're all okay. Like, like I'm not okay with the death penalty, but like we all, there are times when we're like, yeah, actually let's, it's time to kill. And, but, and, uh, so, so we actually but is that are, murder though. Yeah. I mean, if it's, if it's, I said senseless killing, and I guess that the justification mm. for capital punishment would be like a, you know, almost a retributive justice for an evil committed. So that would right. be senseless. Like you can kill without a being murder, right? Right. Like yeah. The differentiation between killing and murder. Or yes. something of that nature. So like when sure. we say murder, I think we're all kind of thinking of that, like, first degree murder like you intended to go out and take this person's life without your own life being at risk or them having been sentenced to death or anything like that or even well, something yeah. else like what about like rape sexual assault things like that things that are truly awful you know like is that another thing that i that's the closest thing i could think of to a moral constant where you couldn't justify that in any culture under any uh, so cultures, yeah cultures lens. justify like marital rape all the time we're okay with like people in prison being raped we even relish in it we like we're like we relish in the fact that you're gonna go to jail and get we raped relish in prison rape wait a lot of people yeah. not, not us but a lot of people do <laughs> yep i grew up in that bubble where people would talk about it like that's what they yeah. get i hope they drop the soap oh i hope they learn like i hope they drop the soap i haven't heard that i've heard people say yeah. things like if you drop the soap don't that drop might the soap. Soap. no 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 yeah. like so so <laughs> like, joe joe God, i hope you drop the soap <laughs> Was it Joe Arpaio? Like the there was like some guy that was like uh, in, in some some county in Texas that was um like running prisons like extremely unethically. Arizona, like I'm, I'm yeah. pretty sure, yeah. yeah, I'm pretty sure like people like like uh like yeah. dehydrated to death and stuff. But like prisons there, they like got them all like pink outfits and like pink fuzzy right. handcuffs and stuff just to like you humiliate them and like yeah emasculate so again, them. We like violence when we think it's justice though. Right. Like it's same for like nine eleven terrorists and things like that. Like we enjoy hearing about them being waterboarded or you know that sort of crap. Obviously, yeah, lots of times we, you know big groups would gather to watch somebody be beheaded in town square yeah. back in the day. Like yes, when it comes to violence, that seems Hillary justice. Clinton laughed about what happened to Gaddafi. 
So I would say, like, as I get older and I think of how to be more, like, in my humility and my joy, I think of treating my enemies with more dignity than they could have treated me at the time. And so, again, I want to move society, if I had to, towards the direction of actually treating prisoners with more dignity, actually not doing the death penalty unless people want to choose death, like, not actually, like, like heading in a societal direction where we're actually treating people who have committed crimes with so much dignity, it uplifts all of society versus yeah. bringing us down because we do go down a peg, I think, and closer to evil when we engage with like evil people and we think like we need to get back at them. It's like, well, at that point, after you've thought about it, you've captured them and put them in prison. I do think killing them against their will is basically murder. You've premeditated it. So I don't think mm -hmm. it's justice, but I or I think it's justice in a legal sense, but not in a spiritual sense, not in like a closer to dignity sense. But I think Arena's been trying to say something for a while now, maybe. Yes, um, I, I do have to go soon, but I this murder conversation and I've been wanting to talk about the acorn woodpecker for a while. But this this is a fun case study of is this murder? So quite. I'm going to try to go through this quickly, but acorn woodpeckers have pretty similar mating systems to humans. They have monogamy, they have polygyny, and they have polyandry. So monogamy and polyandry actually work pretty good. Uh, with polyandry, the female just has to mate with each male equally. The male doesn't know which child is his, but if she mates with them both equally, all is good. That's the problem of paternity, <laughs> about knowing about paternity in human societies, right? And with, But with polygyny, um, and, and then polyandry, sorry, I'm going to finish off why polyandry is beneficial for these this particular species. With polyandry, the female gets more resources to take care of her children, and she just has to lay one egg at a time, one for each. Now, with polygyny, here's where things get interesting. The male, even if he mates equally with the females, if one female lays an egg, the other one will lay an egg. Well, now I gotta lay an egg. Well, now I gotta lay an egg. And suddenly, there's too many babies, too many babies to take care of. Mm -hmm. And the original female that that male mated with will actually destroy the nest, will fight that other female and kill the fertilized eggs. So this, these are not like empty eggs, right? These are fertilized eggs. And I have a picture here that I put in chat if anybody wants to look oh, and read shit. about this animal behavior of um, a female throwing an egg out of the nest. Is this evil or is this just socially acceptable acorn woodpecker behavior when a male makes the mistake of trying to engage in polygyny? <laughs> Well, do they understand the harm that they're committing against their fellow egg is the real question. I, I imagine so, right? Because birds are very protective of their babies. And then how does that other female whose eggs but also got destroyed There feel, might be an overriding right? like evolutionary <laughs> instinct to get rid of those eggs. It might just feel like the most right thing in the world. Like ordinarily I should take care of this. But right now this is this is threatening like the order. So this egg's got to go. You can't get off the edge. It might just feel like totally natural. Yeah, see, to me it depends on if the bird can feel empathy or not. As to like whether it'd be evil, if they can feel yeah. empathy, then it would be evil. If not, then it's just you know a matter of their instinct. Wait, that's why I generally don't assign evil to animals. Well, that's weird for I me do to have think to head they out. need empathy, though. Sorry, Tom. I have to head out. I appreciate oh, you. Thank having you so me much for being here. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank Good you. discussion. Bye. Appreciate you. Bye. Guys. Bye. Later. We'll end soon, guys. I know I've kept you here for so long, and I really appreciate it. But wait, are we saying <laughs> we need empathy in order to? exclude the judgment of evil because i feel I like so. really mm -hmm. yeah it goes back to like um like knowing what you're doing is wrong uh because but can't you know if you, even if you don't know you can understand the harm that's being done is was my three-part equation if you can like something is being harmed and you can perceive that harm and then you do it anyways i think is like my evil equation that's why i generally don't assign malice or evil to animals because i don't know if they necessarily like understand the harm that's being done i don't yeah i don't by, like that like participating I don't, in it i don't like that because I, I the way i see it we all are um like fooling ourselves. I think that when we when 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 we use that equation, um, I think that it's so it's a it's convenient because it lets us think that like oh they actually knew it and stuff. But like we we all do that. Like we 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 all trick ourselves and in the moment like like so so like 
when you catch your like with your spouse cheating on you and you have a gun in your hand just by coincidence and you just get overwhelmed and you just shoot them you know like like on the beginning of shawshank redemption okay that's what i was thinking yes yeah th- th- so like he 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 knew right but like um I, it's just like it's it's a knowing but we're still all capable of being insane I, like while well, every one of us could have been a serial killer it's very unlikely but like it could have happened we got like that in i don't want to condemn that version of me that that could have been that i, I want to do like i i want i would want if that was me i would want people to be as kind to me as possible given that with circumstances I agree with that entirely, Smith, because I I think that most people do justify their actions in order to justify the things that they do in the name of their appetite. However, I also think that there's the other end of that where there, there's somebody, for example, they find a wallet on the floor. You know, it has like the person's address inside of it. They open it up. It's got like five hundred dollars inside of it. And then they're like, you know what? This would really hurt that person if I just yoink, took that five hundred dollars out and just, you know, then sent it back completely empty. However, some people would still be like, you know, despite that, I'm going to go ahead and take that. There might be some justifications that go along with that. Like, well, you know, I need some money and stuff, but you know, you are taking that $500 away from somebody else and you are consciously deciding to do that. I think that that is like at least the root of bad, if not the root of evil, um, is just, just have that knowledge of what the harm is going to be to the other person, evaluate that and still decide to do it anyways. Yeah. Okay. There's so much more we could say. There really is, but I really do want to let you guys go. It's really late. It's like 3 a.m. here. So I know it's it's been a long time for you guys. Thank you so much for being here. I do appreciate it so much. Do you guys want to go ahead and tell people where to find you? That way you could just like promote yourselves a little. I want everyone to go check you guys out. Genevieve, do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you again for having this. I really love these conversations, even if we don't I I love that we don't have a conclusive answer, right? Like, there is just a lot to think about. So thank Mm -hmm. you all for providing your perspectives, first of all. Um, Online, on all the social medias, I am Madam Genevieve. The best place to find me is on Twitter. That's Madam underscore Genevieve. And you'll find all my links in that bio. And I will link everybody as well after this goes. I'll put it in the top comment, guys, so you guys can find everybody. And then if you guys want to say any last words, please do. Just in case. Genevieve, do you want to say any last words on the subject matter? Mm, no, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> How evil of you. Harmony. <laughs> <laughs> Try your best to be good, boys and girls. That's Christmas is coming. <laughs> True. Yeah, Christmas. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Harmony. Um, Harmony Bancroft. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, that is my sex work account over there, just to give you guys a heads up. Um, also, I, this was just a really great conversation. I had a ton of fun. Um, I don't have anything going on YouTube yet, but I'm like totally interested in conversations. If anybody like wants to have more conversations with me, like I'm totally open. Just throwing that out there. Um, but yeah, I think this panel was great it really reinforced kind of um like my beliefs i guess about humans and our adaptivity um and it was yeah great to to talk to everybody yay uh arena uh i'm arena nana on youtube and then on instagram and tiktok monoshock.john john spelled j-a-a J two A's N. Um, this was a wonderful panel, um, and yeah, I just really love thinking about things like big, big picture, and then small, small picture down to the proteins and the DNAs. Um, yeah, thank you all. <laughs> love it, sleeve. Yeah, I had a lot of fun talking to everybody, uh, except for Smith. No, I'm just kidding, buddy. Um, but yeah, I uh, really had a lot of fun. It was good to dive into these panels. I've actually, you know, it was great to talk to Irina. It was great to talk to Harmony for the first time. Obviously, Madam Genevieve and I have conversations about this stuff all the time. Um, and this gave me a lot to think about, definitely. I'm always interested to hear how other people think about these subjects, since I generally assume that I have to intellectualize my way to where most people are at with these types of things. Um, so it was a cool conversation for me. I think a lot about dark philosophy. So if you guys are interested, you can check me out at Sleeve T Rock. Or if you're feeling spicy, you can check out Dark Sleeve Rises on Twitter, where I put all of my dark philosophical thoughts. And there is a YouTube channel coming for this as well, where I 
philosophize about the dark side of life. It's kind of my thing. Um, but anyways, yeah, I had a lot of fun. Thank you for having me, Brittany. And uh, by the way, I just wanted to mention really quick, Jen and, Jen and I just celebrated our 10-year anniversary uh, two days ago. Yay. So, uh, you know, we're fight. We're out there fighting the battle of good and evil together every Ten single day. Ten years is amazing. So, Congratulations, yeah. guys. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's really exciting. Uh, anyways, yeah, Sleeve T rocks on everything. Check me out if you like rock and roll or if you're into dark philosophy. Check out Dark Sleeve Rises. Perfect. And Smith. Uh, I'm Smith. I'm Real Smith on YouTube. Real Smith and not not Real Smith. It's Real Smith. Um, and just make sure that you get it as Real Smith. Um. Yeah. I'll link it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll link it. And I'll link Tom I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. Well. Yeah, I'm trying to go for like a Norm MacDonald vibe with that. I don't know. Mm, uh, mm. It didn't work. He's got uh, a vibe. Sure... He's got a vibe that Norm. Yeah, it's hard to replicate. I did it the other night. Anyway, I'll probably talk to Melanie <laughs> sometime though. All right. Melanie. Melanie or. Arena or Harmony. Ar Harmony, Harmony said uh, they talked because you said if any of you guys want to talk to me, I'll Yay! talk to I'll talk to Marina too, and also uh, someone in my chat named Melanie, so that's why I got confused. <laughs> I'll talk to totally whoever. fine. I'll be yeah, whatever you want me to be. Commit so oh. down to talk to just to right about anyone. <laughs> Let's go. Okay, I love it. I love it. Thank you guys so much for being here. I do appreciate it, and I can't wait for the next one. Talk to All you right. guys soon. Yay. Bye. 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 Oh my goodness. Okay, what do you guys think? That was fun, right? Hey, where is my camera? Wait, I'm not still on Discord, right? Hold on. Wait, what's happening? What? What is even happening right now? What is literally happening? Wait, why is why is it completely disconnected from my Discord? <gasps> Hold on. Why isn't my camera connecting? Wait, that is so weird. What? Why isn't my camera connecting? Have I completely forgot how to do my job? Hold on. Oh, hold on. Let me try to say hello to you. Here I am. Hello. It was so weird. Am I weird? Am I like misproportioned? No, right? Hold on. Don't switch. I think my computer was confused about the Discord I was using. Holy shit. I definitely look like it's 3 freaking a.m. for me, bros. I look crazy. Okay. I actually really like the suggestion you guys made in the comments about doing Discord panels on stream. I didn't think you guys would be into that. But if you guys are into that, then I would love to do stuff like that. Um... Congrats on a great first panel. Thank you so much. Technically, this is our second one. Our first one was on BDSM, but this was like the first one with like a lot more people. Um, I want to do more, of course. I'm open to more contentious like subject matters. I just want it to be about ideas because again, the world is already full of people who are trying to um, make it work with what we have. And again, I want to always encourage individuals to think about how to examine their own existence and life and how to have, you know, balance with those things. And also to do things a little differently than you've been doing them before. And also well integrating, you know, the past and the things that have worked for the past. So I want to integrate all of it. Um, I'm trying to think, I actually wonder, maybe we can even test like a discord panel, um on monday like i'm open to it i know it's friday now uh tomorrow we have the discord 101 and the discord if you guys want to join us at 11 a.m pacific 2 p.m eastern and 8 p.m cet we have the discord 101 to talk about my work and so that happens on discord and is not recorded or streamed but if you guys would like i'm very down to do like discord viewer panel streams to add in some more discussion we'll do it through discord that way everyone's vetted and at least 18 plus but i think that would be amazing um i'll take a poll for the discord and we can talk about like what you'd like to cover and what we can talk about because i'd love to open more opportunities for my community to discuss ideas you know what i mean um make sure you vet the people you have on though well i know everybody in my discord so i mean that's how i would do it i know everyone in my discord but if you're very new to the discord um, you might have to wait a second before you're added onto a panel. I'm not sure how I'm going to work it out because I don't have mods to vet people. And I don't know, I could do maybe pre-talks. I can like talk to somebody really fast. 
Um, we'll figure it out. I'm, I know most of the people on my Discord who are active, and I trust all of them to be very conscientious adults who are very, like, thoughtful before coming onto a panel, so they'll know the rules. You know what I mean? Um, but with that said, um, I'm trying to think of what else. That's a good idea. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. There were so many of you here, and I, I really do appreciate it. I know it's um, – I'm new to this, but I really hope that my panels will add, like, a new a new way to have discourse, you know? Can we do a quick poll on the what the audience thinks of the conversation? Oh, yeah. Good, evil, or neutral? Uh, the conversation or people? <laughs> what did you guys think about it? Did you guys like it? Did you like the panel? What did you think? Was it good? Did you want to see something different? Should I take notes? What would you want to see different? You know what I mean? Because that would be really helpful for me to figure out how to host them in the future. How did I do with moderation? You know? Did you figure out how to raid yet? Yes, Tom Foolery taught me. He taught me how to raid people. So now I can do it. I can do it now. I can do it now. We need more disagreement, dissenting opinions. What well, kind of defeats the purpose of having a discussion? But yes, like what would that look like? So how would you have a discussion, right, that's, more disagreement or dissenting. I, I would be with people who have very strong opinions about these things, um, which is hard because not everyone has a strong opinion about evil or even if they do, it's like, how do you discuss it? So how would you guys want to have that discourse or that discussion? Would you come on? Would you do like a Discord panel? Because I'm down. Like, I think that'd be great. If you guys even want it on Monday, we could do Discord viewers. Um, are humans inherently good or evil? You know what I mean? Um, and we can talk about that together. If you guys want to start preparing for Monday, I'll do it with you. I don't have anything planned. You know what I mean? So Les Smith, I like him. I don't know why people don't like Smith. I think he's so important to the discussion because he brings up a lot of things that a lot of people are thinking. I feel, I feel like a lot of people are, are struggling with ideas in a similar way. And it could really help to have somebody on the panel represent those ideas. After this panel, I realized the internet is no longer for me. Oh, no. It was really fun to hear everyone's ideas, but I also think you did a great job moderating, Brit. Okay, good. Um, let's see. I love the panels you put on so far. Great moderating. You definitely curate discussions that are civil and thought-provoking, which is really refreshing in this space. It was fine. Sounds fun AF. Okay, for Monday, I would love to do it. I'm so mad you got rid of the Boomer Brittany emote. It just wasn't clear. Like, I feel like the text wasn't clear enough. You know? Do more authentic tube content. What's that? Discord panels would be so fire. Okay, let's go. Let's go. If you guys want to, if you guys are active, if I feel like, if you guys are extrovert enough to come on my stream, I will do that. Are you saying he's simple? No. I'm saying no. I would argue the reason I think Smith is interesting is because he's not very simple. But he's also um, learning to be simple, which is interesting. Like, Smith is trying everything and thinking about everything. And I'm excited to see him problem solve. Like, it's so interesting. And he makes me think about things. And so I always appreciate a voice who makes me go, oh, okay, okay. Like, it's nice. The topic was kind of boring, not going to lie. So this is what's interesting. So I want to explain to you one of the experiments that I'm doing with these panels. So people will say, I want a discussion, but the discussion that I watch, the things I spend my free time like listening to, people aren't yelling back and forth. So this felt like one of those discussions that I would be listening to in my free time, right? Where you're just like problem solving, throwing ideas at the wind. And yes, it's not very contentious, which means it's boring, but is it the subject that's boring or is it the fact that no one's fighting that's boring? Do you know what I mean? I want to know, right? I agree with Ingrid. It was a little boring. Is it boring because the subject is boring or because no one's yelling at each other? Is it boring because we're not tearing at each other, other's throat or is it boring because the subject is boring, right? Like that's what I want to know. Because for me, like I like stuff like this and this is what I watch in my free time, but I also know it's not always what the audience wants. The audience wants the stimulation of the combat. So that's, 
that's how you know what I want to know. I thought it was really good. Thank you. I thought it was really good. The subject was boring. Oh, well, that's just like that's fair. Um, one of my favorite subjects personally, right? I loved it a lot. Um, I actually loved it a lot. I was very engaged, but not very overstimulated, which was great for me. Oh, great. I love the subject. Facts, discussions are fun to listen to, not boring at all. Okay, so it was the subject for you guys, a couple of you. I could think about it for hours. Me too. Me too. Okay, so cool. I'm okay with a couple of you finding it boring. That's okay. Not everyone's going to be interested in every subject matter as long as it's not boring because you want the contention. The subject was kind of boring for real, but for me, it's because I think about this topic a lot and didn't hear anything new. Fair, 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 fair. And remember, we're cross, we're crossing um, audiences. And so remember that their audiences might be hearing things for the first time or not, but also how we have the conversation. Um, I'm interested to see if you guys would have a different conversation, like this idea of evil being away from society as well. Like I think society reflects what they think evil is, but is evil something you could find outside of society? And I do think it is what, again, I define as evil for this thing from joy. Because I think joy and evil exist around us and outside of and inside of society. So I would love to have that discussion with somebody. Like how do you have a relationship with evil and joy outside of society if we're looking at joy as the opposite side of evil? You know what I mean? Um so it's interesting, right? He's definitely not vegan. If he hasn't realized every living thing around us has con has a consciousness, how deep of a thinker is he actually? I think that's a judgment that's a little, well, that's a little, that's not a very introspective statement, right? What do you mean? You should be able to answer that question, right? How deep of a thinker is he actually if he believes what most people believe? We just thought of thinking of everything as a consciousness. That is a very minority thought process that's like a total bubble thought which is like very valid but are we forgetting what sphere we're in most people do not, most people do not think everything around us is a living consciousness that's a very specific belief system that is a very rare concept for most people I do not think most people are thinking that at all right like people are just discovering that maybe that's true that is a very, like, even on my Discord, we were arguing about that, like, two years ago, about plants having consciousness, and some people thought I was crazy. I think that's a very specifically new thought. You know what I mean? I need, uh, I need philosophy baby books when I finally pop a new, a few new consciousness out of me. Let's go. Let's go. I don't think he said he was vegan. He wasn't vegan. That was, like, a joke at some point, but he's not vegan. You know, I think honestly, I kind of like vegan food, bros. I dated this person in Seattle and they would take me to like vegan restaurants. Vegan in Seattle is bomb, you know, it's bomb. I love the panels you put on so far. Great moderating. And you definitely curate a discussion that is civil and thought provoking, which is really refreshing in this space is kind of my focus. I'm sorry. I read that twice. But yeah, that's a judge's statement for real. If you're introspective enough, you won't need to ask that question because of him having that point a viewpoint won't be surprising. I, I get really excited when people learn things and Smith is trying to learn and I would love to curate a space where he feels like he's learning in this space. And I, again, I learn from him and I want, I want to engage with him. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know. Like I, I really appreciate watching people figure things out. You know what I mean? Um, in my mind, the topic has a simple answer and watching people stretch it out gave me a bunch of bra moments again. That's just me. You know, I think people, that's the problem. It's like, what do we mean it has a simple answer? Damn, now I want you guys to jump on the Discord so we can have the discussion. What does it mean to have a simple answer, right? We say like, oh, this is so simple, good, evil, this, this. And yet humanity is not displaying that it is very simple or easy. Like humanity as a whole is not displaying that as easy or simple or they are in denying it. So that's what I'm curious about as well, right? Like when we say like, oh, this conversation, like we've thought it, we've never, you know, we've all thought about this before. We have all thought about it before, but have other people. And as a content creator, I am thinking about the people who might come into my audience who have never thought about this before. You know what I mean? Like someone's got to be the person who goes, yeah, you don't have to be X, Y, Z. Let's go. You know? So then I have to ask the question is like, why do we think this is simple? Why do we think we all know it? Why do we all think we know it, right? I don't know if it's simple. I don't know if the answer is simple. 
I don't want to be vegan. You don't have to be vegan if you don't want to. Um, Discord says, now the data is very convincing. I've seen enough research to explain that animals and plants are both conscious, conscience, consciousness. Maybe not as high as humans, but what does that matter if humans only use their consciousness to blow things up and rape people? <laughs> Discord is sassy. Discord, sassy. Okay. <laughs> Literally, humans are so arrogant. Humans are like, I am better than the life of a plant. Um, ma'am, you build nuclear weapons, ma'am. Ma'am, you serial rape, ma'am. Let's go. I like people who are a little combative, though. I like a good balance of seriousness and playfulness. I thought everyone did well, actually. I really liked the balance of everyone going back and forth, you know? They're debating enough to add spice to the convo, but respectful, balanced enough to allow the convo to be a genuine discussion and flow nicely. I thought so. I loved everybody on this panel so much. I just love everybody. You know what I mean? It's interesting how defensive people get about being called a vegan, though. Like, bro, it's okay to be vegan. My mom raised me vegan. I'm vegetarian now, though. I'm a harlot. Ooh. Ooh. I do love vegan food, though. It'd be popping, bro. I love vegan. I love meat, but I love vegan. I'm like Asmin. My favorite snack is, you know, beef jerky. I told my husband, like, once we get it, like, a, uh, a diffuser, dehumidifier, in here, I'm making my own beef jerky every day like I did in Arizona. I'm making my own jerky. Let's go. Oh, I love homemade jerky, bros. I'm excited. Yeah, for me, I personally love seeing when people have a light bulb moment. Oh, and it helps you have a light bulb moment. Again, I really want to remind people of how little we know. We just don't know things. What we have is, an, they're like, we have an idea of what we think we know. But we really don't know. And if we know enough, you would think we could explain it to other people. But the thing is, like, there's something they don't know or something we're not saying or something we're not having a, a relationship with, you know? I really, I'm excited to keep doing these. Like I said, on Monday, if you guys want to mentally prepare, I will have you on to discuss from a Discord perspective. Like, um, we could do the good and evil and see how it goes. Even if it's just one or two of you who want to call in, I'll talk to you. I'll do it. Why don't we mentally plan for that on Monday? I will hold a space on the live stream to invite people on who want to come on. Just make sure you have good mics. You don't have to have a, a camera if you don't want. Obviously, if you break TOS in any way, you will be blocked and banned forever. So be, you know, aware of that. Like, don't say slurs, okay? Um, don't flash the camera, stuff like that. And then obviously, I'd prefer to choose usernames that I've had interaction with on the Discord so I know you're like a real one. So if you're interested in joining that discussion, you better join and join the Discord 101 tomorrow and put on a good show so I can put you in the approved list. Um, but yeah, I think that sounds good. I love them too, but they were just meh this time. Interesting. Yeah. Note to self, I wonder though, are you subconsciously wanting the, the dopamine? That's what I'm saying. Like, this is how normal people talk when they're not arguing. Are we saying, this is a great challenge to my audience. Do we want the combat? Be honest. Do you want the dopamine hit? Do you want the contention? Do you want the fighting? This is a really good introspective moment for us. For anyone who said they were just meh today or like, oh, it wasn't a vibe or it was a little like boring. Again, what was really missing? And if it was like, oh, no new information today, that's fair. But then that's a personal preference. And then it's not really answering the question of like, how did it go today? Because you're answering for yourself, not for like, oh, other people are really going to learn from this today, which is fine. But I'm more curious. You know what I'm saying? Like, how are we answering the question? That's what I'm curious about. Right? Because if it's just like one or two of you who didn't like it for yourself, like that doesn't matter. We're talking about like for the community, the discussion as a whole, the way it went, you know, was it interesting enough? Not every debate's going to hit, but I want all this feedback so I can start putting data together. I was wondering what Smith brought to the convo. Any thought he has is all over the place and it's hard to understand what he's actually trying to say. I'm waiting for him to surprise me. I disagree. I just don't think you understand him. I don't think you can see him. Smith is very concise. He's very focused and he's very clear about his stances. I feel like Smith does not confuse me. He makes so much sense to me. Like, I can see where he's coming from. I can see why he got there. I can see where he's going. And sometimes he surprises me a lot. I feel like you can't see him. I'm going to make an argument with you. I feel like you can't see him. I feel like if you can't see somebody, anything they say is going to sound crazy. Like, I think I saw someone in the comments wanting to fight Arena over the biology comments. Like, you know, you could do that. 
you could do that if you want, but like you're probably fighting her on a thing you're not thinking about. You know what I mean? Like you're probably fighting her on a thing that like she's not going to argue with you on maybe. You know what I mean? I think there was a good enough amount of pushback between people. I mean, people over talk. They talked over each other multiple times. You know what I mean? <laughs> Listen, I'm cutting out carbs. That's my excuse. You know what? Fair. Fair. Do you know what? Fair. Oh, my gosh. I really appreciate the feedback, goes though, guys. Like, please don't take. I'm just, like, throwing ideas out there because, again, I want people to understand why they also felt a way about it and why they also had an opinion. You know what I mean? Because, again, just because you have an opinion doesn't mean it's right. And this might be your opportunity to be introspective, right? I think the energy was warranted for the convo they had, especially considering that this was the first time a lot of them are meeting each other. True. And considering the topic, like, I don't know what more could have been said. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it went perfect. And it was the first time a lot of them were meeting. So hopefully now that everyone has a relationship with one another, we can build off of that. And I'll put everyone's socials in the pinned comment of this video. I'll keep this video up. I'm not going to make it members only, of course. And then, of course, I'll put a timestamp for when the actual panel starts since I came in later. Don't ask my opinion if you don't want it. No, I do want it, yo. I want it. I just think it doesn't – You're. I'm going to challenge you to be more introspective about why you had it. Like when you said that someone's username was silly. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you say that? That's not very thoughtful. <laughs> like, what? You chose the most harmless thing, and you're like, I'm just going to share this opinion. Like, what? What is that? Where is the introspection? You know? That's why it was boring. Wait, it was boring because, because why? Like, why? When you said, like, you said in the chat, hold on, you said this. I don't want to, you said this. Discord, this, I'm sorry, we're having a secret Discord conversation now. So Discord uh, gave a suggestion of someone they would have wanted on the panel, which literally would have gone totally against having a conversation. It would have been a debate, which is what I'm trying to say. Do people want conversations? And you're proving my point. You want a debate. You want a debate. You want the dopamine. You want people to fight because that's the only reason you would say you would want that person to come in. That's what that person brings to the energy is a debate, is a I'm wrong, I'm right, you're wrong period. And then they like, that's what I'm saying. I am very interested to see what audiences really want from spaces. Right. And I'm very interested to see what it is. Because if it's really the debate, then are we any better than the debate space? Are we any better than anyone else in the space? You know what I'm saying? Are we any better? Because there was a narrative for a while. Oh, the debate space sucks. It doesn't give like enough nuance. But do you even want the nuance in the first place? Or do you want the debate? Or do you want the debate? Which is no problem, right? That's not a problem. I'm not moralizing it. But I want us to be, because uh, I'm doing a little data. I'm doing a little data collection with this, guys. I'm thinking to myself, does my audience really want a discussion? Do anyone on the panel really want a discussion or do they want to, do they want to debate? And if you guys want to debate, let's go. You know, maybe I just have to give in debate. Maybe I should start yelling at people. Maybe I should have a button. You know what I'm saying? Maybe I should have a button. <laughs> I like the civil conversation too, but I get it. Right? I get it. I get that people want to debate and they, you know what I mean? He's interesting and actually keeps the conversation alive. Ah, that's the dilemma, right? It also leads to like people feeling like they can't speak their mind. And if it's too debatey and if somebody is dominating the conversation, it also makes other people feel like they're not sharing ideas. They're proving their right to have the idea. And that's the difference. When you have, when you have a debate, you're proving your right to be in the space. When you're having a discussion, you're saying, I'm valuable inherently. I'm allowed to be here, right? So I liked it too. I'm glad a lot of you liked it, right? 
So I thought it was good energy and everything, but that's something I want to pay attention to in the details. Do we actually prefer conversation where someone has to fight for their right to be there? Or do we want to build a space where people can have the conversation? You know what I mean? And that's what's interesting. What are we talking about kids for? Ooh, what's going on here? Ooh, YouTube getting spicy? Ba -na 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 -na. I enjoyed the panel as is. Don't listen to chat, just listen to me. Me and Kay taking over the world. Please, no debates. Okay. I really liked it. It definitely felt like there were some varied opinions, but people were able to present their stances in a way that felt like a discussion rather than a debate broing each other or memeing. I liked it. I thought it was really nice. And I'm glad a majority of us liked it and everything. And again, maybe we'll have like, maybe the Discord will add more like, because we all know about each other a lot. You know what I mean? Because we all know about each other. It will add like a, a little bit of like comfortability spiciness. But I don't know. I feel like when you meme during debates and like you do that, like that's the problem is like you belittle people. I felt like this the space was really nice because there was no belittling. There was no like bringing up weird dicks or anything. Like people get really personal when it's like when you know, like you know what I mean versus like talking about ideas. Um, so we'll see. We'll see moving forward. But thank you so much for giving me your input. I really thought it was really beautiful. I thought the first panel was more interesting, but I think the personal preference on the subject matter, fair. BDSM is pretty great. It's pretty great. I actually love peaceful discourse, so keep it like this. Ah, okay. We'll do two different styles then. We'll allow the Discord. How about this? YouTube panels will have a balance, and then the Discord will allow a balance. If the Discord wants to come up and yell, fine. Follow TOS, and we'll have a, we'll have a panel. And also, if YouTubers want to come on and yell, we'll have a discussion about it. So everyone's consenting to what environment they're going into right? So we'll do that. We'll balance it out, guys. I mean, I like a little contention too. Damn, you know? Okay. So on Monday, to, to say it again, on Monday, I will host for Discord members who've, who I know and have interacted with at least for a little while. So like everyone who's on right now. Okay. You should be good to go. I just want to like Okay, I don't want anyone to join last minute just to like troll the Discord debate panel, but I'll try to grab you guys in. Um, and do you guys see on the Discord, you should see my waiting room. It's only one person at a time right now. I'll change that and I'll make it like uh, five people to start with and then maybe I'll add some people to it. And next week on Monday, if you guys jump in, I'll grab you into my room and then we'll have a discussion on whether humans are inherently good or evil and then we can switch, switch subjects if you guys want. I'm very down to talk to my community. I think you guys are great. I love talking to you on VC. But if you want to talk on stream, uh, especially if you're aspiring streamers and you guys want to, you know, cross, you know, have idea battles, I think that's even better because, you know, then you're a content creator and you know how the game works and, like, you're comfortable in the space. Um, but if you're just, like, a Discord member, you're also welcome. You know, I just don't want to pressure anyone to show up on stream. Um, yeah. And you don't even have to have your camera on. You can just do voices if you want. All right, there. We all came to a conclusion of what we're doing. I will see you Monday for the panel for Discord members. Okay, it will be fun. We'll stream it. It will be good. It will be good vibes. With that said, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Tomorrow on the Discord, okay, I'm doing my Discord 101. Before that, I am filming a video for the behind the scenes members. I'm making Keldean cheese bread. You're welcome. A Syrian cheese bread is going to be delicious. Okay, so. Discord 101 tomorrow. It's a great place to, you know, introduce yourself into the community. You don't have to talk, but it's a great place to meet people and to voice your opinion. You can yell about my work. You can criticize me. You can do anything in the Discord 101. That's what it's for, okay? With that said, I will talk to you tomorrow on Discord and Monday on YouTube. All right, guys. Have a great night. Here's some music by Elvin. Links in the description. Bye.